Hi, Rashmi. Hi, Lydia. Hi. Hi, Vinny. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi. All the best. Thank you. I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Vinita also. Uh, yeah, Vinita would know Lydia, right? What? You don't know. I'm thinking, yeah, Lydia knows Vinita. Yeah, I know her from a long time ago. Right, Lydia? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Good luck for today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, Dr. Malik. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Ah. Hi, good evening from India and uh, uh, welcome for a new session. Thank you. This seems wonderful. Yes. Uh, also, um, here is my colleague, uh, Lydia Fernandez. She's from the BSc IT Information Technology Department. And there's uh, also Zanitin. Uh, who will be one of the good speakers. Morning. Good morning, Dr. Malik. <laughs> good morning, Professor Varghese. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not a professor at all. <laughs> Anyone <laughs> who teaches is a professor. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a confusion here. <laughs> For all of us. But yeah, but I think that's one of the titles that we uh, generally use to address each other. Yeah. All right, I think we can just start. Uh, Nitin, uh, are you okay to go? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so I'll yeah. start then. All right, a very good evening to each one of you. Uh, welcome to St. Xavier's College uh, to this second series of the online lectures. We had a wonderful session uh, beginning from Jan to uh, February. And this is a new series that we planned and we are grateful to all our speakers over here uh, before we go into the introduction, um, we are a 150 year old college, over 150 years old college, and uh, uh, it is wonderful to be part of this great Jesuit institution um, where um, not only as teachers do we teach, but we also learn every single day. And it's a wonderful work atmosphere and um, also the teaching learning process that takes place in this college is something that uh, students tend to remember. Uh, and as, as um, teachers of the institution, it's a place where we would love to grow. So this is an opportunity once again to listen to different scholars and we are extremely grateful to our partner institutions and also our, um, um, our faculty members whom we became friends with in the course of different lectures that we attended. Uh, so I'm very grateful to um, uh, Nitin Varghese, who is here with us, would be our first speaker, and our partner institution, uh, Creighton University, with whom we've already had a collaborative program just recently. It's still not concluded, and we continue into the next step, and we are very grateful for the presence of Dr. Surbi Malik. And we also have our own in-house faculty, Ms. Ankita Gujar, who will be joining us soon. Uh, and this is a session that we all look forward to because popular culture is something that all of us engage with, whether we study it as an academic discipline or not. And uh, uh, the fact that it is an academic discipline makes it all the more interesting and challenging because one wonders, what do you learn in pop culture? Uh, because, um, you know, the basic definitions will tell you that it is something that's popular. It is something that is also inferior sometimes because people tend to look down on it. And it is something that you learn from at a daily, um, on a daily basis. So um, Mumbai being the center of Bollywood and uh, probably one of the largest film industries. 
Secondly, we are also looking at um, another very interesting area uh, called science fiction and of course, superheroes. Uh, I think all of us have some hero or the other. So it, this will be a great time to engage uh, academically uh, in this forum. And I'm extremely grateful, as I said, to all the uh, faculty members who've come here, to our students who are participating, to colleagues from other colleges and students from different colleges. So I'm very grateful that this has become a forum for all of us to come together and engage. Uh, so thank you all for your presence. Uh, without much ado, I'd like to hand it over to Ms. Lydia Fernandez, my colleague, and also part of the Council for International Programs to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Rashmi. It gives me pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the day. Nitin Vargis is an assistant professor of English at St. Birchman's College, Changana Cherry. His areas of interest are Middle English literature, literature theory, and Indian aesthetics. He has, to his credit, many scholarly articles published in reputed national as well as international journals. He is also a University Grants Commission Inter-University Center for Humanities and Social Sciences Associate at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla, Himachal Pradesh, look at India. He has studied uh, literary, literary theory at the University of Oxford as part of the Sakura Exchange Program sponsored by Japan Science and Technology he visited Japan and lectured at Sofia University, Japan. He also participated in the summer program in Japanese cultural studies, which was co-organized by the Center for Japanese Studies at the University of East Anglia, Norwich, and the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures. With such an interesting background, I think all the participants gathered so far are eager to listen to him. I now humbly welcome Nitin Vargas to take the platform. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, Rashmi, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm I... delighted to be part of this virtual series organized by the Council for International Programs in Xavier's College, Mumbai. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Rashmi and everyone who worked tirelessly to make this event a reality. Yeah, of course, I am grateful for this opportunity. Thank you for, thank you so much for hosting this event and Lydia for your kind words of welcome. Yeah. Um, my lecture is titled Stories of the Future from Rockets to WW84. So the second part of my title hints at what I will be discussing in this talk. And for the next 40 to 45 minutes, I will concentrate on stories, particularly science fiction stories, the various icons and their impact on science and technology. Yeah. Rashmi, can you can you present the slides? Yes, yes. Yes. So let's start with a definition of science fiction. So we know that there are different definitions for uh, the term science fiction or the genre science fiction. But my definition would be that science fiction is a story or a narrative that takes place in an alternative or altered reality. For instance, um, if you look at the movie Blade Runner, by Ridley Scott, directed by Ridley Scott and uh, starring Harrison Ford, which is based on Philip K. Dick's 1968 novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? You can see that uh, the movie, the novel, sets in 2019 Los Angeles, which is, um, uh, I mean, which is full of dust after World War terminus. So, a dystopian setting. So, this setting brings us some of the defining features and characteristics of science fiction. So the first thing is that the stories are usually set in the future, in space, or on a different planet, or in an alternate dimension. And these stories, they combine fantasy and science to create a sense of an alternate reality that appears to be quite possible. So here, a word of 
a word about science in science fiction. So please note that the science in science fiction is extrapolated science. It is not the current science, it is an extrapolated science. That is, the stories feature plausible laws and theories that are partly fictitious or speculative. And of course, these stories, they include advanced technology, they include time travel, space travel, extraterrestrial life, and uh, dystopian elements like the setting of uh, do Android stream of electric sheep or the pitch boy version later. And in short, we can say that many science fiction stories, they describe experiences that are beyond the scope of normal human experience. So all these things, space exploration, time travel, um, or even uh, our familiar world transformed by a new technology, ecological change or alien visitation, they are outside our, um, or beyond our level. So science fiction, they focus on all these experiences which are beyond our human experience. Yeah, next slide. So let's see uh, some different terms on science fiction. Yeah. So the term science fiction, it was coined by the Scottish poet William Wilson. William Wilson in his 1851 book, a little earnest book upon a great old subject. So in this book, Wilson coined the term science fiction. Actually, he intended to provide a manifesto um, for a type of fiction that would dramatize scientific discoveries and celebrating the insights gained. But uh, this term science fiction was not adopted by anyone else due to a lack of a ready field of reference in that time. However, um, the existence of a genre of futuristic fiction based on scientific speculation um, became sufficiently obvious to require a label with the publication of uh, uh, Francis Power Kobe's 1877 book, The Age of Science, 1877. So initially the reviewers and critics, they preferred other terms, but these two terms, scientific romance and Vernian fiction, they gained the widespread acceptance. But the latter term, Vernian fiction, um, they primarily applied that to juvenile fiction. Then later, the American writer, um, who is famous for the science fiction magazine, Amazing Stories, Hugo Gensberg, actually he coined the term scientific fiction, scientific fiction, and he popularized the term scientific fiction uh, in 1926. And later, uh, we can see that all these terms were replaced by Williams's, William, Wilson's term, science fiction. So we have science fiction, then scientific romance, Vernian romance, scientific fiction, and later science fiction. Yeah. So now the different times and some of the key moments in the history of science fiction. Next slide. So we'll concentrate on three issues in this section the types, the prototypes, and the pioneers in the field. So hard science fiction and soft science fiction, they are the two broad categories of science fiction. So the first category, hard science fiction, in which the primary impetus for the exploration is one of the so-called hard or physical sciences, such as physics, chemistry, biology, or astronomy, geology, and possibly mathematics, as well as the technology associated with it, or um, growing out of one of these sciences. And uh, the American science fiction writer, Peter Schuller Miller, actually, he is the one who coined the term science fiction in 1957, 1957. Then uh, the other category, the second category, soft science fiction, um, we can see that uh, in this category, the primary impetus for exploration is from one of the so-called soft sciences, that is the, the sciences focusing on human activity, social sciences, social sciences. So we can see that um, the, the stories based on uh, some of the organized approaches to knowledge such as sociology, psychology, anthropology, political science, historiography, theology, linguistics, 
and uh, even mythological approaches will come under this soft science fiction category so this field soft science fiction this is neither scientifically accurate nor plausible it is the antithesis of hard science fiction it is just opposite of hard science fiction and uh, this term soft science fiction was coined by an australian literary scholar peter nicolas in uh, uh, late 1970s peter nicolas then the prototypes or the the first set of writings in this category so one of the first novels in this genre was mary shelley's frankenstein i know you are familiar with mary shelley and mary shelley's frankenstein so uh, this form was later popularized by the french author verne jules verne jules verne i know there uh, i mean some of them mary uh, jules verne for example um, his texts like his uh, Uh, famous texts like uh, journey to the center of the earth or from earth to the moon 20000 leagues under the sea so they are some of the popular texts of the jewel one then we have we yeah, are hc wells the british the english author hc wells who is famous for time machine invisible man the war of the worlds so one speciality of hc wells is that he was a trained scientist he was a trained scientist and uh, when when you compare uh, mary shelley with hc uh, wells or jules verne with jules uh, verne with hc uh, wells the one uh, benefit or one advantage of hc wells is that he was a trained scientist and because of that he can easily understand he can easily practice the scientific principles or he can apply those scientific principles in his text yeah then we have other writers like isaac asimov who is famous for foundation series then we have ray bradbury the american um who is responsible for introducing science fiction to the mainstream of literature then we have hayne lane who is known as the dean of science fiction writers then philip dick who is known for blue and red string of electric sheep then we have arthur c clarke rendezvous with rama published in 1973 so they are some of the chief practitioners of science fiction and at the end of 20th century we can see another set of writing which is called a cyberpunk literature actually cyberpunk literature that is a postmodern version of science fiction which primarily focused on the possibilities of information technology so that is the latest one yeah, in this field or one of the sub genres of science fiction cyber punk literature yeah yeah next slide next slide okay. yeah thank you thank you so in the following four slides i'll focus on some of the major icons found in science fiction so first let me define the term uh, icon then i'll use this term, uh, this word this term in the context of science fiction so icon that term is derived from the greek word icon e i k o n icon which means an image but this word icon it came into english language through the byzantine art so in byzantine art icon means stylized representation of christ or one of the saints so a religious connotation is there for the term icon so an icon in the context of science fiction will represent something supernatural or at least otherworldly artistically conventional because some certain features are required and they must belong to the public domain so in the context of science fiction icon that word is devoid of religious connotation it is secular so uh in the first category or in the first set we have uh, three icons rocket spaceship and virtual mvm so rocket we know that rockets were used as fireworks in china in the 11th century and they were later adapted as um, weapons of war in the 13th century but this rocket became an ultimate iconic symbol uh, of science fiction in 1950s so i hope you all know 
the American writer Pynchon. So Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, actually that novel gave a new twist to this icon. So Pynchon's novel, which is set in the closing days of Second World War, it centers on the design, the production, the dispatch of V2 rockets by German military. So V2, the vengeance machine or the, the vengeance rocket, vengeance rocket, yeah. So uh, Pynchon's rocket is, uh, is designed after the original V2, the original V2 rockets, the vengeance weapon, yeah, the world's first launch range ballistic missile. Yeah. So it is modeled after V2. Then, um, so as far as science fiction is concerned, rocket is a deadly icon. And this icon, it stands for the climatic achievement of technology or the triumph of technology as well as the death wish of modern civilization. So death wish in the sense, people's ability to destroy themselves, themselves and the others, also the, 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 the war. So the, uh, uh, I mean, the after effects of war, the, the skip. So all those things are involved in this, uh, in this icon rocket. Then, uh, then we have this spaceship. Yeah, spaceship, we know that uh, it is a vehicle used for space travel. So spaceships, they are one of the key plot devices in science fiction and numerous short stories and novels are built around the various ideas of spacecraft. And uh, one good example for this spacecraft uh, is, or spaceship novel is, um, the, the novel is A Rite of Passage, Rite of Passage by Alexei Panshin, Alexei Panshin, which is uh, published in 1968. That is considered as a classic example of starship no, sorry, spaceship novel, spaceship novel. Yeah, then the third one is virtual environment. Um, so the virtual reality, computer generated virtual reality. So this term, it dates back to 1930s and uh, um, the concept or the concept of virtual reality has now used, uh, came to prominence in the, in the 1980s with the rise of gaming, video game, video game. And uh, video games, they are the classic examples of uh, this uh, virtual environment. Um, so one example for this virtual reality in fiction is um, Permutation City published in 1994. Permutation City by Greg Egan, E-G-A-N, Greg Egan, the Australian science fiction writer. And uh, in this novel, we can see that uh, a kind of immortality has been achieved by copying individual personalities into, into um, a vast computer network where they can live on uh, in a shared virtual reality. So actually what Egan did in this novel is that actually he reconstructs the notion of self, memory and physical reality. So he handled the term, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, he handled this theme, uh, virtual reality, uh, intelligently and hopefully in a uh, permutation city. But what happened is that this novel is one of the, the underrated novels in science fiction. Permutation, it's, it's very difficult. It's a complex novel. It's very difficult to read. That's why people uh, don't favor such kind of novels. Permutation city. Yeah. The next set. So next set, we have uh, one, two, three, four. Yeah, four. Icons, robots, androids, and gynoid, cyborg, and alien, aliens, yeah. So robot, we know that robot is a term coined by Carol Capek in his allegory, uh, R-U-R, Rosen's Universal Robots, where the term describes the artificial labor, laborers who represent the working class. So actually Capek, he derived the term from the Czech word robota, R-O-B-O-T-A, which means force the labor. Then in the play, R-U-R, we can see that the robots, they are produced in order to free humans from the necessity to perform manual labor. Manual labor. But uh, what happened is that uh, that situation, that utopian situation, uh, it, uh, it became a dystopian uh, setup. So robots, they produced in large number and they outnumber human beings and they, they become rebels. They try to seize power from 
human being. So that's the, the theme of uh, your art. Then, uh, so in literature or in film, in art, the first definitive robot was Roby, R-O-B-B-Y, Roby, -B -B -Y, Roby uh, which is featured in the 1956 movie, Forbidden Planet, Forbidden Planet, directed by Wilcox. And this movie is considered as one of the greatest science fiction films of 1950s and uh, that is uh, considered as a precursor of contemporary science fiction cinema. So in that movie, actually a robot was featured. Then we can see that the, the American writer Isaac Asimov, um, a professor of biochemistry at Boston University, uh, in, a, in a series of short story collections published between 1950 and 1977, um, who developed the concept of robot with his eye robot, then the rest of the robots, the bicentennial man. So he developed uh, the icon of the robot in literature. Then we have androids and dinos. So android, they are the artificial being designed to look sometime to act like a human being or a a machine with a human form that is Android. Android. And uh, one good example for Androids, the representation of Androids in literature is Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick, which is the base of the movie Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Then we have Gynoids. Gynoids is the, the, the female Android. Female Android. But uh, we can see that these dinoids, they are designed to please men. So we can see that uh, the 1972 novel by Ira Levy, so the Stepford Wives is a good example for uh, uh, dinoids. And these dinoids, they function uh, as allegories, yeah, allegories uh, for the objectification of women, even if science fiction, yeah. Then we have cyborg, cyborgs, a contraction of cybernetic organism. And this term was coined by Manfred Kleins and Nathan S. Klein, A-L-I-N-E, in uh, 1960, cyborg. So um, uh, another term uh, with, I mean, Bionic man, B-I-O-N-I-C, bionic man. This is another term used by uh, Kaidin for C-A-I-D, novelist Kaidin for uh, cyborg. And uh, I hope you are familiar with Harari, Donna J. Harari, because Donna J. Harari is famous for her essay, A Cyborg Manifesto. And she defines or she describes cyborgs as hybrid of machine and organism a creature of social reality as well as a creature of fiction. This is how Haraway describes cyborgs. And the one example for one uh, this uh, cyborg in literature is uh, the novel Cyborg, which is published in 1972 by uh, Martin Kaiden. But you, you, I mean, sometimes you are not familiar with this novel, but you are familiar with the TV series uh, of this novel. The TV series is known as the Six Million Dollar Man, uh, serialized between 1973 to 1978. Actually, in that version, you can, you will get the term bionic man rather than cyborg. And the last one in this category is aliens. So the, the non-human sentient beings, usually from outer space and sometimes from other dimensions or exotic and unknown regions of Earth. Cyber, oh, sorry, aliens. And uh, these aliens, we know that they are one of the most prevalent and powerful motifs in all of science fiction, giving this genre considerable capacities for commenting on uh, difference, yeah, difference, and on the encounters with other in our own world. So aliens have been featured in countless stories, uh, but the idea of alien, extraterrestrial aliens, they can be even found in ancient literature, but this uh, motif became so popular or prominent in the 20th century. So you can, you will get so many movies with uh, 
uh, aliens are featured. So you 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 can see one set of series called Aliens, where you can see uh, this icon. Then the next category is about the the animals and minerals that you can find in uh, science fiction. Next slide. Next slide. So animals in science fiction actually they are they serve as foils to human beings. So the writers they they use animals in order to contrast them with uh, uh, the humans because sometimes uh, these these animals they offer insights about our own foibles. So what might happen if we fail to address them? So therefore we can say that animals in science fiction they serve the basic purpose of teaching us about ourselves. Then uh, the minerals. So you will get plenty of uh, science fiction minerals in so in different movies and different um, uh, novels. For example, kryptonite. So appears in Superman stories. Then adamantium appears in Marvel comics. Then feminine uh, appeared in Wonder, Wo Wonder Woman series. Then Rama, which is uh, featured in Rendezvous with Rama. So all these materials are not familiar to us, but uh, the writers, the, the film, they gave the idea that such materials, such minerals are there in uh, this world, in this universe, in this universe. Yeah. But the thing is that they are extrapolated. They are extended, external. They are speculative. We don't know whether these things are... Uh, existing in this universe or not, they are extrapolated, yeah, speculative in nature. Yeah. Then the last category would be, next slide, the, the, the two, uh, uh, two uh, icons, mad scientists and damsels in distrust. So the figure of mad scientist is one of the staples of science fiction. I hope you are familiar with H.G. Wells' novel, the I, the island of Dr. Mori. So there you can see a mad scientist. So it is the tale of a mad scientist. So he performs some macabre uh, surgical experiments on animals on a remote island. So such people are featured in so many, so many novels. Another, another example would be uh, the 1918 novel, uh, Timescape by Gregory Benfo. So there we can, you can see uh, uh, two set of uh, scientists. They are involved in the development of a time travel device. So such mad scientists are there, are featured in, in uh, science fiction novels. Then we have another category called the women, the damsel in distress. So women characters in science fiction, they are actually marginal characters. They are represented as stereotypes they are represented as exotic, they are represented as sex objects. So please note that damsels in distress, this is a classic theme in world literature, in art, in film, and in video games. And these damsels in distress that trope involves beautiful women, innocent women, helpless young female leads, and uh, um, they need uh, a male hero in order to rescue from her villain or a monster of an alien. And after rescuing her, um, the, the hero they often obtains her hand in marriage. So this is a theme that you can see in, uh, in, uh, in films, in novels, in art, and in video games. So um, um, one critic called Joanna Russ, Joanna Russ, so she says that there are plenty of images of women in science fiction. There are hardly any women. So you can see so many female characters, but you can't find any woman in uh, science fiction because women in science fiction is portrayed as, as I said, as exotic, as alien women, as sex objects, or even or as damsels in distress. And one reason is that this genre is developed in a patriarchal culture, in a patriarchal culture. So chiefly written by men for men. That's why um, we don't have so many 
uh, strong female uh, protagonist, protagonist. But you can see that in the 20th century, uh, there are some female icons, for example, uh, the uh, Buffy and Summers in Buffy the One Bear Slayer franchise. Then we have Lara Croft and we have Wonder Woman. So such kind of powerful female heroes are there, but they are very few. And please note that these uh, female heroes, whether it is Wonder Woman or Lara Croft or Buffy, they are, or they have to be seen as alter egos, not as rivals, but they are the other side of human personality, the alter egos. Yeah. Then one, so I'll finish with this line. So it's a question. Is science fiction truly a story of the future? So let us attempt to answer this question. Is science fiction truly a story of the future? Last slide, plain. next slide, next slide. Yeah, thank you, thank you, yeah. So I believe that science fiction, uh, it has always served as a source of inspiration for various aspects of real life. So if you look at uh, the things in the screen, bionic games, video calling, CCTV, touch screen, Kindle, credit card, so you are familiar with all these things. So CCTV surveillance, video calling, we have Skype, we have um, uh, WhatsApp, we have Duo, right? Or uh, So we have different apps for video calling. Then we have touchscreen technology, we have touchscreen laptop, we have touchscreen mobiles, Kindle, Amazon Kindle, credit cards. So all these things are featured in literature first. For example, bionic limb. So bionic limb, this is very, very popular in science fiction um, because, um, I mean, a human being, if he is devoid of a hand or a leg, I mean, you can replace that with a robotic arm or a robotic leg or even some no organic uh, implants. So this thing is first featured in uh, the, the TV serial, Six Million Dollar Man. And even you can see uh, the, the character Borg, the BORG, Borg in Star Trek franchise, or even the villain Darth Vander in, um, uh, in uh, which one? the Star Wars universe. Yeah. yeah. So you can see the bionic limbs. So the, the representation of bionic man. But late now, this is very, very common. Then we have video calling. So as I said, you told you, you know, there is no one. No one, you tell him now. There is no one. It's okay, it's okay. Yeah. So video calling, uh, we have video calling is a known. So as I said, we have Skype video calling app. But this thing was first featured in a novel called the Ralph 124C41 Plus. Ralph 124C41 Plus. Actually, in this novel, I mean, this is a novel by Grinsback. And in this novel, actually, he created uh, a fictional video screen called the Telephot, T E L E P H O T, Telephot. So, this novel was published in 1911, based on 1911, 1911. But now, so video calling is the novel. And one interesting thing regarding the title of that novel. Ralph 124C41 Plus. So actually that title is a word play. So it, it means one to four C for one another. One, two, four, C, four, one, another plus. So it's a word play. So actually that novel introduces uh, a fictional video screen. And now it's a reality. Then we have CCTV. And actually CCTV, it creates a new area called the surveillance studies. So CCTV, uh, which is described in uh, George Orwell's 1984, I mean, actually that is not CCTV, but it, I mean, the idea is that the people, they are constantly watched under the mysterious big brother. Actually, he watches each and every step, every move of a person. So the novel was written in 1949 and CCTV 
was introduced in 1970. So surveillance. George Orwell introduced surveillance in 1970. Surveillance as um, what? Manifested. Yeah. Then we have uh, this touch screen, as I said, touch screen technology. So we have different, even, even game source, uh, which are uh, uh, which ha has this uh, this facility, touch screen. And uh, in 1978, the English writer Douglas, Douglas Adam, uh, actually he published the novel, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So in that uh, novel, Douglas described the technology of a single screen controlled by touching. A single screen controlled by touching. And the, that later became a reality by the invention of touchscreen technology. Then Kindle. So we know that it, it, Amazon Kindle, it gives a new experience of reading book in digital format or even the, the tabs. So if you have um, a book in a tab, you can, you can carry that thing, you can sit anywhere and you can read that thing in the digital format. Actually this thing, uh, this, this digital form was mentioned in a 1961 novel called Return from the Stars by the Polish writer Lem, Stanislav Lem. So he described a, a machine um, which consists of books turned into crystals with record contents. So from there, that, that record contents became a reality with the introduction of Kindle in 19, uh, in 2007. So 1961, Lem talks about uh, this digital books and in 2007, it became a reality. Then the last one, the credit card. So we know that, I mean, now credit cards and debit cards, they are accepted as a form of payment all over the world. I mean, uh, you people and I use credit cards and debit cards, but credit card or debit card, they were predicted as fiction in 1888 in a novel called Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy. So Edward Bellamy predicted credit cards and now it's a reality. So the answer to this question is science fiction, truly a story of the future. My answer would be yes, science fiction is the story of future. So today, this may be a concept, but maybe after 10 years, after 20 years, after 50 years, it would become a reality. So the writers, they are not scientists. They sometimes, they do not have any background, any scientific background, but they predicted the, the development of science and technology. And sometimes the researchers, I mean, I mean, they they took some inspiration uh, in uh, or, I mean uh, uh, with these things, and sometimes these uh, researchers they found some breakthroughs with the help of science fiction. So in a way, we can say that science fiction definitely plays a significant role, and at the same time, its influence is growing. So my answer to this question is: science fiction truly. A story of the future, my answer is yes. So whether it is Wonder Woman, whether it is a robot, whether it is uh, a gynoid, whether it is an android, sometimes, uh, I mean, maybe after 25 years or 50 years, we can, we can see, uh, we can see the development of science, we can see the development of technology, and at the same time, sometimes, science fiction, these books, these novels, the imagination of the writer became the base for that invention of discovery. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nitin. Uh, we have some questions, so we'll start with one question at least. Um, Rajat, if you can please read the question. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so the first question is, sir, uh, Sci-fi is often criticized as being rather predictable as it leans on a lot of common tropes. Do you think that this conventionality has its advantages? Uh, this, Yes, sir, please go ahead. 
So, can you repeat the question? I, I, I can't see that question in the chat box. Where is it? Uh, one second, I'll send it to you. Sure, sir. The question is, uh, science fiction is often criticized as being rather predictable as it leans on a lot of common tropes. Hmm. Do you think that this is this conventionality has its advantages? Um, so, uh, many critics, they said that science fiction is predictable, predictable because it involves a lot of... Uh, 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 ordinary common tropes, common tropes. So, uh, as you said, as you said, uh, this is one uh, criticism against science fiction. It is predictable. It is predictable, but it has its own advantages. It has its own advantages. I said, science in science fiction is an extrapolated one. Extrapolated one. So uh, sometimes the science in science fiction is. Uh, is not at all, not at all true, not at all true. So uh, the writers they believe that sometimes uh, this science and the, or sometimes this thing will will uh, uh, will uh, what to say will go in that line. So they, they think like that. They think like that and uh, they they record what all things in in the novels. So. Um, so, uh, regarding the science in science fiction, don't consider it as uh, accurate science, but that's, I mean, it can be accurate, it can be partially accurate, partially true, or it can be false at all, false at all, at all. But the thing is that uh, the writers, sometimes they are prophetic. Um, with that machine or with that icon or with that theme. Sometimes they are prophetic and uh, and later this may or may become true. Become true. Okay. Uh, 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 thank you, sir. The next question is from uh, Dr. Malik. To what extent is science fiction a narrative of dystopia that is already here rather than in the future. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so when my answer to that question is that science fiction are sometimes, or science fiction contains dystopian elements. So the, the, the reason is that, so I, I take that example, I mean, do Android string of electric sheep. So in that novel, you can see that uh, human beings, they are moving from Earth to Mars because uh, there happened a war in Earth. It's called a World War Terminus. So that's an uh, uh, atomic war. Yeah. So after that war, the, 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 this world, Earth is full of dust. So people can't leave here. So that's why people, they are moving to uh, Mars. So, the, I mean, the thing is that actually Philip K. Dick wrote that novel in the background of Second World War, in the background of Cold War. So, actually, he is predicting this is what going to happen. So, if it is beyond our control, so, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, everything will be, uh, will be turned upside down. So, there is another, uh, another short story called The Moxon's Master by Ambrose B.S., Moxon's master. So actually, this short story deals with an automation, a robot called uh, a robot. And uh, the scientist behind that automation is Moxon. So Moxon, he created this automation, this machine. He, I mean, uh, I mean he invested his, his time in the creation of this uh, machine. Actually, this machine, it is very much uh, close to man. It has sense. It, uh, it, it, it behaves like a man. So one day, uh, Moxon and uh, this automation, they started playing chess. So what happened is that towards the end, Moxon defeated this automation. But this automation, it couldn't control its anger and it, 
killed its master. So this will happen if uh, science take um, its hand on us. So that's why, uh, or in that sense, the science fiction are um, uh, dystopian in nature. Dystopian. Thank you. Okay, I think we can take sir. one last question. Yes, sir. So the next question is Ushita, by. Can you be louder, please? Yes. Uh, the next question is from Minakshi Kulkarni, and she asks, uh, "Can we have a relationship between science fictions and culture?" Uh, Rashmi, can you repeat repeat the the question? Because um, I mean, it's raining here. I. So I I didn't hear the question. Uh, the question is: Can we have a relationship between science fictions and culture? Can we have a relationship between science fiction and culture? So um, the answer is yes. So we can have a we can have. Or we can uh, relate science fiction with culture um, um, because uh, the science fiction is the product of, um, I mean, this century, right? This century. So we know that um, so many technological advancements are happening in this area. I mean, in our world, and writers they are taking cue from those technological. Um, side and they are uh, writing these novels. So in a way, uh, science fiction and our culture they are related. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, there are there are questions, but I think we'll uh, email them to you. Okay. So we could go to the next session. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank so you. So I'll be here. I'll be here. I want to yeah. hear Doctor Subhi sure. and uh, Doctor Anju. Sure. Yes. Uh, so we can have Ankita. Maybe you could uh, um, set up. Yes. So Rashmi, the problem is even I have network issues. Um, so I won't be able to share a PPT because if I share that, then my video gets disabled. I don't have the bandwidth for that. So okay. um, I can send the PPT across later, and I think it should generally be okay. Yeah. I'll try to keep it as interesting. as possible with other powerpoint as well okay uh, let me just uh, allow me to introduce you um i'm very happy to introduce my colleague and friend uh, ms ankita gujar who is from the department of sociology and anthropology she has been uh, teaching for the last 10 years and she says she specializes in creative ludic pedagogies social linguistics feminism and expatriation women's representation in media and popular culture Uh, she is also a qualified uh, french educator and she teaches at alliance uh, in mumbai um, and um, she is um, also an enthusiast when it comes to uh, superheroes and popular culture so thank you ankita for agreeing to be part of this session and over to you all right um thank you so much nitin i enjoyed your session enormously um and being a science fiction uh, aficionado it was very very fun to watch so thank you for that um all right so let's get straight into it um i am going to focus my talk unfortunately because the powerpoint is not working i'm just a little um, hassled but i'll i kind of carry it ahead with out that okay so um when we think of superheroes and um when we think of um the term superheroes itself um uh, i'm going to include in my discourse superheroes as too uh because we tend to assume that heroes are always masculine and that is the nature of uh the discourse that uh, a lot of superhero films have centered around so the topic that i've taken up is superheroes markets and morality and uh the moral reflections of structures of society and i'll be approaching it from a socio um, anthropological gaze which is coming about from say uh um ethnographic structural analysis uh from looking at political economy and development as it reflects on how we um inhabit and enact that space in artistic forms and one of them being films and uh, the industries related to uh 
film technology and uh, script writing as well to a certain extent. Um, along with that, I will be ending my talk with fan fiction, which I hadn't announced before, but I thought it's an important conversation to have in the context of um, particularly how we can engage with uh, superheroes and how they are written and why a rewriting of them is essential and it's a democratization process of sorts. So um, my analysis of superheroes locates itself in uh, social anthropology, particularly the works of Victor Turner. And uh, the, the, the people I'll be referring to, I've made a list of them, so I'm just going to put them in the chat box, uh, which is uh, going to be um, one second. Trom Baudrillard, uh, who talks of similar crime simulations. And um, Victor Turner, who is a social anthropologist and an ethnographer. Um, and his theory of social drama is what we're going to look at. Uh, we're also going to be looking at Adorno and Horkheimer, the culture industry, something that you may have heard of before. Uh, and if you haven't, that's quite all right as well. So let's start off by looking at uh, what does Victor Turner say about social drama? And uh, his definition of social drama is uh, effectively a um, sort of an, an eruption from the level surface of ongoing social life. And any of your films that, that depict superhero stories, uh, even if they're origin stories, will often start off with why did that hero need to emerge? And uh, possibly because of some sort of a breach in social life on an everyday basis. So the four stages of Turner's theory effectively reflect how a film transits from one stage to another. Uh, you have breach, you have crisis, you have regressive action, and then you have reintegration. And I just want to have this as an interactive session as far as possible. So um, thinking about these four stages, okay, where there's breach, um, crisis, redressal, redressive action, and reintegration. Um, how do you see any uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe film or a DC verse film reflecting that? Um, any examples from you guys? Are you guys comfy keeping this interactive as far as possible? Yes, uh, surely. I think I'll just open the chat box if you like. Okay. Ashish, great. Captain America, how so? There's always um, some kind of a... Sorry, yeah, go on. Yeah, sorry. So, well, so, I mean, you start off with, uh, you know, he's this guy from Queens and, uh, well, he, he's just, uh, you know, he can't even get into the army. And he does want to do something for, uh, like, you know, to his, his bit in the war and all. So, yeah. well, he signs up for an experiment, which is, um, you know, I mean, something that is new, something that is completely different. Uh, they're not even sure whether it's going to work or no. And uh, so okay. that's him, you know, so that's his, um, I don't know, that's the origin, like. All right. So it's it's interesting because everything in 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 the U.S. is hunky dory. It's going well, and then suddenly it's on the brink of war, and then you need yeah. recruitment happening, and then of course the escalation of this happens with the actual war taking place and him taking part in this war, of course. Right. Okay. So there's a breach, and it reaches. So there's a there's you know um, everything is beautiful and everything is static and it's going well. Static in a in a positivist sense. Okay, it's going well, and then there's. Well, there's one moment where there is some form of a collapse, some kind of a chink in that armor, and then it escalates, of course. So there's, there's a crisis that happens, okay? And in comes this guy to save the day. There's a dress of action. Um, interestingly, Captain America was uh, created as a character to uh, combat the image of the US after the Manhattan Project. So the very fact that you talked about him being from Queens uh, in New York, of course, and um, the notion of uh, the US as using technology and technological militarism to destabilize uh, world powers, okay? And here you have Captain America who's righteous, who's doing uh, something for, who's a little man, who becomes a big man, who's doing something for the little man again. And it's a sort of, um, um orientalism but not from the colonization sense but from the development uh, sort of discourse which speaks to the fact that america is going to bring liberty it's going to bring the right morality to the rest of the world and captain america is going to be this vision of this sure he comes from manhattan but he's the positivist force to what was the manhattan project uh, for those who are 
uh, just let me know if I'm using too much jargon or uh, facts that perhaps don't correlate. So Manhattan Project refers to the nuclear bomb, the uh, the creation of the nuclear bomb, and uh, the 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 technology that helped uh, the U.S. sort of uh, win in World War II. And uh, okay, so anyway, uh, we also have this model of breach crisis redressive action where people step in and save the day and then there's a reintegration and this is beautifully seen in the avengers where um you have the avengers initiative which is um, started and it deeply reflects global political economy and international political economy and how it operates according to principles of privatization and this privatization that we're looking at is um if you guys uh, are aware of uh, the the us war in afghanistan and iraq and the fact that there were um, private contractors who were sent off who were specialists in certain missions who were sent off to uh, they were paid through sort of uh, the uh, budget of the armed forces itself and the budget of the us for the armed forces and uh, but they were not recruited into the the main they were not uh, they would not receive pensions they would not receive uh, a, a standard sort of you know uh, a stable job so to speak it was temporal and it speaks to this sort of technological militarism but also came in economics which is reflected in this uh, militarization of uh, uh, this privatization of uh, the military um, and these specialist tactics and shield uh, in the mcu represents this sort of um, um, this this engagement of the us uh, government in hiring specialists who are more efficient uh, than your average human of course in this situation uh, who are more efficient more productive and it reflects what global capitalism demands it's um uh, in your superheroes you are searching for qualities that capitalism demands in you as a worker and interestingly captain america while being this righteous uh, sort of um um model of what a, a good soldier ought to be or a good soldier ought to represent in his origin story there is a sidelining of the working class issues of america of, of the america of that time and uh, what is often not seen behind this individualistic representation because individualism is something that comes about from developed societies and developed countries uh, and that is precisely what sort of nietzschean superhero morality also speaks to which is uh, that it is the individual who's the center of his own morality and the collectivism sort of goes to the side a little bit and um, in 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 this situation what you uh, realize is that a lot of recruitment that happens um into the armed forces in the us also happens from the poorest of the poor states and they are given incentives to uh sort of uh join the armed forces for a specific amount of time so you if you sign up for 8 years to 4 years you get like an immediate uh, means a, a monetary incentive to effectively give your body up for the nation and working classes are working class towns particularly that um uh, are on the verge of economic collapse are sort of great spaces to start these recruitment campaigns and um, in in a sense in in a simelian sense in a george simel who talks about labor and he says that work is effectively prostitution and what he's saying in that effect is that uh, it to that effect is that um all work in global capitalistic societies involves you selling your body to the highest bidder okay and that part of militarism is never explored because you're too busy looking at the values that captain america represents to dismantle what he actually is um uh, representing as a structural uh, aberration to who is recruited and under what circumstances so um sorry rashmi i'm just reading your uh, superheroines but always sort of need um uh, some kind of superhero to bring her into the limelight okay uh all right i'm assuming that was okay i don't know the context of that but i will <laughs> go ahead with the next part and perhaps i can contextualize that statement later okay um another thing that we see emerging uh, parallelly to how uh, the the reason why this plot line of social drama breach crisis redress of action reintegration works um and you'll see this beautiful this sort of end credit scene where in the avengers where everybody's eating shawarma in that restaurant which became like this epic scene of course is that all the superheroes have gone back to a a sort of banality of sorts okay um and um 
what we realize in terms of Iron Man sacrifices, he takes the nuclear uh, uh, bomb that's been uh, deployed by S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, up into this uh, portal and then he kind of allows it to um, uh, definitively um, detonate over there and then falls back into Earth. Um, one of those things that it represents is basically the idea of the individual savior. Uh, we have sort of a shift away from the power of the commons, the power of the collective, the power of um, communitarian action. Um, and we see the idea of what Weber talked about, the capitalist ethic, okay, the, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. He speaks about how individual um, engagement with the idea of predestination uh, influences your acts, okay? And, um, and, and this precise, efficient, uh, positive, positivistic value system-based, committed, uh, sacrificing human who is honorable is going to be the savior of the day. And it is not going to be society that co-opts for certain uh, mechanisms of redressal that is going to save uh, the world. And if they do come together, it's usually to save one human who is the superhero. Okay. And um, interestingly, we see this technological determinism and this uh, influence of uh, uh, technological militarism and technological capitalism um, as emulated by um, a, a lot of our billionaires today in terms of how we fetishize the celebrity billionaire on uh, social media, whether you look at Elon Musk and Elon Musk, who was constantly compared to Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man uh, at the start of his career when he started SpaceX, or for that matter, you have Richard Branson of Virgin Galactic. And um, it reflects a sort of in, in Branson, in Bill Gates, of course, in Steve Jobs, um, we are using what are enlightenment systems of modernity and our values of modernity, which is uh, science and technology and rationality and man's engagement, and I say specifically man's engagement, man's engagement with these is what will save the world and what will save the universe. It's um, a linearity of uh, production that we see in the sense that if we don't have enough resources on Mars, uh, so if we don't have enough resources on Earth, so the way to acquire these is to colonize the moon and to colonize Mars, okay? And and that is uh, our superhuman capability uh, and, and sort of pushing human capacity to its absolute limits. And, and this is the uh, endowment of uh, your billionaires and uh, it is reflected in Iron Man and Batman as well, okay? So uh, the two most popular um, sort of uh, heroes with uh, a large part of Redditors and Quora uh, individuals, and of course, on our social media sites. Um, interestingly, um, it also reflects um, in, in Iron Man, there's this one scene where he is, um, he, he says, I believe one second, let me just find that quote. He says, I have, um, Iron Man says, I have successfully privatized world peace. And I find that to be a fascinating quote. It also, uh, he also speaks of, uh, um, in a sense, one second, uh, I'm just trying to remember that line. Um, the idea of collateral damage when it comes to military tactics, okay. And there's this one scene where um, Iron Man builds an exosuit to combat the Hulk um, and uh, it's, it's bigger, it's larger. And then he crashes through an entire building and his response to crashing through an entire building as it collapses around him is how Jarvis, how soon can we buy that building? And it's interesting to see that for this value morality to succeed, uh, you need rich people who can justify their actions because they have enough money to combat some of the collateral damage that they leave behind, okay, in their wake. Um, and, uh, with this, I feel like Ultron was an aberration in that sense, okay? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, Ultron was an aberration. Um, anyone who's watched Age of Ultron and uh, could help me understand why I'm saying Ultron was an aberration. Yes, ma'am. So Ultron was able to, keep, I mean, like the battle with Ultron kind of brought down the whole civilization of Sokovia where the whole civilization was destroyed and a lot of people died. It's perhaps the biggest collateral damage before the blip happened by Thanos. And uh, what happened was after that, uh, the world started realizing that the Avengers need to be held accountable for the collateral damage that they leave behind. And okay. people who have died, you can never spend money and bring them back. The ones who are gone are gone. 
and then you and then basically Sokovia Accords come into play with civil war and all of that. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so the Sokovia Accords are are a uh, are a wonderful sort of um, you know uh, movement away from this utopia that the Marvel Cinematic Universe often represents. In a sense that there is an accountability to superhero culture that is brought about through those, though it's temporary, uh, and of course it sort of builds up another film, which is Civil War later. Uh, but um, in 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 that situation, Ultron is also a representation of the fact that white man's technology can go wrong, and that it is based on emotion. It is not just based on intellect. It is based on belligerence, um, a certain um, sort of in post-colonial studies, you would call it the, the, uh, a sort of a study of uh, genocide, which, of course, the white man engaged in as a colonizer multiple times and that his technology was flawed in that regard. Uh, he's also somebody who is um, made from surveillance society. So he's marginally creepy. Um, sort of problematic in a lot of ways. Technology has its own discourse. And Thomas Kuhn, who deals with technology and uh, society and SSK, which is the scientific, uh, sorry, the, uh, the sociological uh, construction of scientific knowledge. What he says is that science is political. Science is not objective. And if you were to look at the technology that superheroes use um, as a political device, not as something that is uniquely the pinnacle of human achievement, uh, you would realize that their morality as a tool, their morality as a weapon is equally political. And um, so it's not just the weapons that they use. Uh, of course, then again, you have um, the, the sort of, you know, the constant obsession. And, and this beautiful obsession is represented in Iron Man making multiple suits. I think he has like about 37 suits or 38 suits. And then he keeps making models and models of suits as he gets obsessed with perfecting technology. Um, and I think that's a representation of the fact that technology is not perfect. It cannot be perfect. And it is political. And Ultron is a summarial representation of that, which is an interesting aberration to the perfection and the utopia that Marvel, Cin uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, endings often uh, demand. Okay, Even if you combine two films together, like Infinity War and like uh, uh, Endgame together as a storytelling device, of course, just to make more money. And herein comes the Disneyfication of the world. Uh, where Bodria talks about how there is a whole industry that centers around, uh, uh, you know, merchandising, around creating fan uh, culture, and uh, sort of sustaining what the studio earns through uh, other industries as well. It's not just the film itself as an artifact, but rather uh, what follows from it as uh, markets as well. So, looking at neoliberal economics, of course, and looking at uh, the, in, the the global capitalistic system and uh, technological militarism, uh, we also come to the idea of the culture industry and why the standardization is required, and how the standardization is carried forward and creates issues of um, problematic non-feminist narratives that come about. So, uh, one of the controversies around Wonder Woman. Uh, of course, was, um, so you're not Wonder Woman, of Catwoman. Uh, <laughs> apologies for that. Uh, Catwoman was that Halle Berry famously said uh, she did not enjoy working in Catwoman because it's interesting that male superheroes went out there and saved the world. And here I was dismantling a cosmetics empire. And the whole storyline of the first standalone uh, sort of uh, woman-centric superhero film was about dismantling a cosmetic empire. And her question was, why do women have to deal only with women's issues? Um, and why do women superheroines have to deal, women superheroes have to deal with uh, women only issues? Um, and is are, are women's specialized skill sets only meant to help other women? And that itself translates into a, a sort of patronizing discourse by the state as well, where when you have labor policies that are enacted or when you have sort of, uh, you know, uh, your yojanas, et cetera, it's often assumed that people of a specific social class will only want to emulate or people of a specific social caste will only want to emulate certain professions that they've already belonged to. And that's their realm. And that's their uh, sort of, you know, their, their home ground, so to speak. OK. Um, the next uh, idea that I want to talk about is also in terms of how uh, we look at uh, uh, Batman's approach to saving Gotham through, uh, through, of course, there is vigilantism, 
but it's interesting how when he's escaping raz algul's uh, sort of league of uh, shadows uh, from this uh, you know oriental place that it's located in he's perfectly all right with destroying a village to get there but when it comes to gotham he wants to keep collateral damage to a minimum and it also speaks to this othering process that happens in uh, um, in 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 sort of seeing the east as something um, that has uh of course you know the, the exotic spirituality with the incense sticks and the vapors and the drugs and uh the hallucinogenic drugs of course which come from nature and um as opposed to uh you know the 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 amount of collateral needs to be reduced when you're fighting crime in your own city um and um, so a couple of statements that um i felt they're a little disconnected but i want to talk about this which is uh, there's a scene where fox morgan freeman's character in the dark knight rises says this is too much power for one man. and how many of you have seen that film and remember that statement this is too much power for one man and if you remember the context of it yes okay genesis why what is too much power for one man okay i'm assuming if only one person has seen the film i'll just kind of <laughs> explain that beforehand so batman has developed a sort of um sort of his his entire um fox controls the research and development division of uh, batman's uh, enterprises okay and got <laughs> sorry bruce wayne's enterprises um and uh, batman of course uses some of the technology that fox has developed over the years uh, to create a uh Uh, a, a sonar based device that uses everyone's cell phones every individuals or every citizen cell phones to trace the movement of the bad guys okay so at what moment does um you know uh, in 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 a manner speaking you could say that what i don't know won't harm me so ignorance is bliss but how comfortable are you being surveilled and it leads to sort of this larger question of who has the power to surveil and and these are issues that are reflected in how say for example today facebook instagram algorithms uh trace our movements have access to our microphones and our cell phones uh, and our cameras um and how data is collected about us okay and um it's in a sense it's the pinnacle of technology as it is represented at that point of time but also raises these critical questions in terms of uh, the ethics of you uh, uh, a superhuman using technology now batman in that sense is a superhuman because he's reached uh, a level of efficiency and uh, uh, a level of intellect that uh, plebeians like you and i would never hope to achieve okay so um another thing that kind of uh, raises uh, concerns or uh, sort of these these uh, questions that i think we need to um ask about how our superheroes um negotiate good and evil morality and the struggle with uh, these moral choices and human limits okay uh one of them is uh through um i i remember wonder woman which represents the sort of you know uh, has always represented this sort of madonna whore complex in literature wherein uh, either a woman is it, it, she breaks through that in that sense where she is very much in love she is uh, uh, she has a partner uh she discovers her own sexuality as well and uh yet she's a very powerful character whereas you'll often see black widow and um um uh, catwoman being represented as um quintessentially seductive females who are dressed in all black um and and it's interesting how the play of color also happens in that regard and you would see that nonetheless black widow and the marvel cinematic universe raises a very interesting question towards the end of uh her journey before her standalone film comes about now of course is that um how are women's bodies capitalized and how are women's moralities capitalized on by patriarchal systems uh to streamline them into specific uh centers of role play and and methods of role play and uh furthermore with black widow it raises the question of the power that women hold over their own bodies okay and how they actualize it so with the whole uh, dynamic that she has with bruce banner it is um it in a sense raises questions of the ethics of 
creating female spies, uh, it, the, the idea of contraception, etc. And you would see this interestingly reflected in real life examples where the Gates Foundation was a supporter of the family planning programs uh, in the late 80s. And of course, we know that in the 80s, we had the forced sterilization happening in India. And along with that, you also had the imposition of the one child policy of which a lot of Chinese billionaires also were supporters. And so I would say men of uh, men of business and men of technology were supporters of this. And uh, um, you also had the Israeli uh, sort of uh, militaristic, um, in a sense, uh, scientific technological aid that was given for medical knowledge for the enforced contraception of Ethiopian women. Um, so this sort of intermixing of international political economy and the values that neoliberal economics today holds with uh, the amassing of wealth, the fact that wealth gives you the ability to control morality and this being reflected in male superheroes particularly. Uh, is uh, not as unrealistic with, uh, it, it's just that it's situated in a fantastical realm, but it's actualizing, and I hope that also responds to Surbhi's initial question that she asked in terms of how does this, uh, if I may just repeat that, to what extent is science fiction a narrative of dystopia that is already here? And while it's not um, utopia or dystopia, and it's a constant negotiation of this sort of conflict, uh, oftentimes if you take away the, uh, the dramatics of it, you'll realize that uh, superheroes are a reflection of the value morality that we see in individuals as it is represented in media today. Um, I'm just going to disable the receiving because, okay. Okay. You guys can hear me clearly, right? And see me clearly as well. Yes, yes, Ankita. All right. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right. Uh, Okay, so the next point that I also wanted to talk about, uh, Rashmi, just let me know when I reach 40 minutes of talking so we can have a good Q&A no. as well. Yeah, yeah okay. All right. Uh, the next point that I wanted to talk about was Thanos. And uh, of course, from these sort of ideas of forced sterilization campaigns and, uh, uh, you know, the one child policy, we come to sort of this eco terrorism of Thanos as well. It's not that he's representing something that has not been done in the world before. He's not at all representing a new form of uh, political engagement with how we deal with population control. And the reason that population control becomes um, a center point of international politics is uh, it is necessary to recognize where does this population come from and what is the explosiveness of the population that you're attempting to control. And in the larger world, in, 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 in the sort of actual world, if I may say this, uh, in the actual world, this population emerges from developing countries and underdeveloped countries. OK, and while it is disguised as a debate where, you know, even rich people are killed off by Thanos and it's um, and a, a sort of equalizing system of sorts, uh, a lot of times when you look at militaristic expansion, collateral damage in terms of uh, um, Third world countries, whether you look at Iraq, Afghanistan, with uh, US generals saying quite openly that 39 civilians dying for one uh, high value target is perfectly fine, um, is something that um, is, is, is not new. It's not new it, in, in terms of developing countries being seen as collateral damage as well. And um, the second thing is Thanos becomes an issue in terms of this damage only when he says um, rich and poor alike. OK, and it's an immediate threat to the first world in that sense. So Rukmini, just taking up your question. Also, hi, by the way. Uh, does Black Panther represent an aberration? Uh, you sent it to me accidentally privately, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm just going to read it out to everyone. Does Black Panther represent an aberration when it comes to this pro-global capitalism discourse? And since it showed technological power and prowess in the hands of a non-global North nation, um, it's Black Panther has been interesting in that sense because it uh, gives power to the black man instead of the white man. Uh, but at the same time, it represents the same gatekeeping mechanism. So it's raising important questions of uh, the racial reversal of what needs to happen. But it doesn't speak to democratization because the ethical debate it raises at the end of it is should Wakanda open its doors to everyone or should it uh, stay within itself and protect uh, itself from the white man trying to snatch away the technology that it has and the resources that it has. 
okay so um it's yeah it's it's starting that debate but it's not really uh taking it ahead in that sense it, and it's also you have to understand that it's a film that's made by a studio that's taking a risk uh to placate an audience uh that needs to be placated in that sense so it's made for uh uh with a lot of protests happening about the under representation of black characters and the under representation of uh people of color in uh hollywood it's um it's effectively giving voice to that narrative instead of challenging the 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 structure of what uh colonial um sort of colonial influenced uh modernity is doing to our idea of how we interact with resources that come out of the earth if that uh, responds to your question effectively uh abhinav also taking your question Uh, since black widow was mostly objectified throughout the mcu her eventual sacrifice in end game did mcu try to elevate her and accord her a status of sacredness so it's it's precisely that right like why does a woman have to sacrifice herself to become sacred which also plays back into the madonna ho complex where you're either a madonna or you're a whore okay when you're either sort of this this uh virginious character who's uh you know draped in white and uh has all the good morality of the world and otherwise you're uh sort of uh the uh yeah. yeah since we haven't seen the question can you repeat the question for everyone yeah oh uh, yeah yeah sure i'll repeat the question guys if you can just put the questions to everyone so that i think everyone can see them i will still read them out uh since black widow was mostly objectified throughout the mcu uh, with her eventual sacrifice in end game uh did the mcu try to elevate her and accord her a status of sacredness and yeah so i hope my response makes sense in that regard um the last part that i wanted to cover was fan fiction of course and um, oh yeah just one more example jessica alba who participated in fantastic four uh complained about being asked to uh by the director she was asked to cry sexy okay and i found that uh i found that interesting because what does what does a woman crying sexy mean and and why does crying have to be represented in a specific manner so you're also um you know with 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 this what you're saying about the black widow in terms of her objectification and her eventual sacrifice it's also about pleasing the audiences with a structure of society that they represent and often times with the, the structure of um the studios themselves is in terms of casting in terms of direction in terms of board of directors in terms of uh producers where the money is coming from and their value systems are often reflected in what this art becomes which is why you have to be very careful when you look at uh cinematic universes and the serialization of cinema because the serialization continues into other forms as well it is about you know having uh the the shows that come up the tv shows that come up or the ott uh, platform shows that come up like loki or uh, uh, agents of shield and uh, wanda vision of course that's coming up and uh, that come up and jessica jones as well um it's it's the fact that you are capitalizing on women's bodies and typecasting women's bodies uh and why you have a lot of money to fall back on to take a risk with something like uh black panther where you're going to give uh because otherwise there will be protests against what you represent as a uh, a board of directors that's predominantly white uh, you're willing to take a specific risk but you're not willing to overturn what uh you can represent and be um, in that sense rebellious overly rebellious or revolutionary in what you represent because you need to form sort of follow standard format standardization and pseudo individualization culture industry and um in that regard fan fiction becomes an important space because fan fiction is through technology it's a democratization of narratives it's giving the power back to the fans and 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 to people who engage with these to rewrite certain characters in their own light which is why you have uh, uh you know queer ships that tend to happen uh ships uh, relationships with yeah uh hi ashwadan yes it's precisely that way <laughs> so you have ships that represent uh, relationships which are between queer characters you would have a uh, a development or an overturning of uh, you know you have aus uh, alternative universes that emerge within a marvel cinematic universe so if you read your harry potter fan fiction where uh, dumbledore's relationship with his brother or his uh, relationship with um uh, uh 
uh, Nicholas Flamelby is sort of explored further, and uh, where you have uh, sort of this this non-sacrificial, uh, non-villainous woman, okay, um, who is written in an alternative fashion. It's while fan fiction, of course, is also about practicing a hobby, practicing writing as a skill, uh, practicing uh, speaking your own truth. Uh, it is also about the power of uh, spaces like fanfiction.net or uh, uh, archives of our own or uh, the last one that I forgot. Um, it'll come back to me. Uh, to influence what kind of risks studios can take and how studios can then reformulate some of the characters and what our audience is going to enjoy watching. Okay, And that criticality that comes in from fan fiction is, um, is, is feeding into the democratization process of uh, changing art forms that are too standardized, that are not willing to take that risk unless it's going to definitively pay off later. Uh, and and it's, it's a constant negotiation of how much uh, you can break into this Disneyfication of the world that has happened on cinema, on screen, through the engagement that you uh, undertake with technology as well. And how you form these collectives, how you form these uh, communities, these safe spaces that give power to the narratives of the commons. So, um, yep, I think that that about uh, ends my talk on this. I have a bunch of resources that I have compiled, a couple of academic papers, a few videos that I will send across to Rashmi later. And if you guys want them, uh, you can email me as well. So, yeah, I shall end over there. And hopefully um, some of you take up the writing of fan fiction and eventually write characters differently. I think that's my 14 minutes. I started at 7.20, right? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I think there's something in the chat box if you want to take a look at it. I don't know, this is a comment perhaps. If we're talking about Marvel's fan fiction, we also have another example. Absolutely, yeah. Harry Potter visiting world franchise as well. Just the fact that Harry Potter and Draco, uh, and, and Draco is told to deal with his sexuality and his conflict uh, in, in a more positivist light, okay? The very fact that you have ships between, uh, you know, or, or a, a, a very emotional retelling of uh, the relationship between Snape and Malfoy, uh, Draco Malfoy, of course, as something that uh, can be enriched through conversation because normally you would end up saying, uh, you know, you never have these conversations with your father because, of course, fathers are seen as sort of unemotive characters. Uh, yeah, okay. So, yep, that's that. Uh, Rashmi, no, I think I'm, I'm okay with that. So if you guys have any questions, open to questions. And I hope it was enjoyable. I know it's just um, my network's been giving me issues since this afternoon. So. I think somebody's put up his, yeah, yeah, I think. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, my aunt, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I was very interested in your point regarding fan fictions and how they, you know, feed into democratizations of art forms that are too standardized. So, don't you think that eventually this too? I mean, any art form that starts, uh, you know, that that uh, that uh, forms itself uh, leads into standardization eventually because these tropes always form when you're talking about these relationships, these square ships. Uh, I mean, these. Uh, I'm talk. Let's talk about Harry Potter fan fictions as well. I mean, the bad Dumbledore, and the manipulative Weasley family, and all of this. So there are always these tropes that are being standardized in fan fiction itself. So don't you think that becomes a problem again? Um, it, it doesn't. As long as it's a space for new narratives to keep coming in, it's when you assume that fan fiction is supposed to be written in a specific manner uh, alone, and and which is why, in a sense, archives of our own is or fanfiction.net or technology in that sense, social media or uh, Tumblr for that matter, is good for fanfiction because it doesn't, it, it nonetheless gives space to other narratives as well. So even while you have somebody who will take up a ship and keep repeating that ship across, uh, sort of, you know, you um, have 20,000 people who like a specific idea and take it ahead. Uh, but at the same time, it's still allowing others to publish free of cost online. So yeah, um, and, and routinization, is a part of like in a Weberian sense routinization is something that is bound to happen so uh, it's it's nonetheless can you can you create a democratized techno friendly space within fan fiction to keep uh, the novelty factor or the the change factor alive is is important so yeah
I hope that responds to your question adequately. The boys, yes, I wanted to talk about this. I that's a point I forgot. The boys and also um, the Watchmen, uh, Watchmen 2009 film, which sort of looks takes a critical gaze at like why do we fetishize superheroes when we all know that power would corrupt individuals eventually. And so uh, I think uh, Watchmen is the other film, 2009, um, and. Uh, that's another viewing um, recommendation if you want to sort of have a critical gaze towards superhero culture. Um, the boys, I've just seen a couple of episodes, I think three or four episodes, and uh, not had time to watch it, but uh, plan to. Uh, Abhinav, you want to talk more about the boys? Yes, ma'am. So the boys is a sort of an interesting insight into how uh the whole superhero, like this, like the team, like superheroes are basically corporatized and they represent a corporation whose uh, main uh, task is to earn revenue through advertisements and merchandise and all of that. And the superheroes are twisted and they are manipulative and they are malevolent. And it's all about public perception. I mean, the public perceives them to be good, moral, and they behave in a certain way so that the revenue keeps coming in. But uh, there's this uh, other group, the boys basically, who are basically, basically a rebel group who have been affected by the collateral damage brought about by these superheroes. And their main task is to bring them to uh, basically bring justice to the ones who are affected and all of that. So yeah, I think it straight away dives into the whole capitalist structure surrounding the superheroes. So, yeah. Um, also in terms of say, um, I just put it up in the chat box, in terms of how we look at influencer culture and how we endow our influencers with specific capabilities, uh, whether this is a makeup guru or somebody who has a fabulous body or even for that matter how we tend to look at the body positivity movement as uh, somebody who is a plus size model and then we kind of tend to fetishize who they are and this fetishism of one aspect of power that you hold is uh yeah it's along the same lines uh jessica uh fan art is another place uh uh sorry fan art is another platform that's challenging the standardization of the way these superheroes are depicted absolutely different drawing styles different costuming uh covering up um and in fact uh just the idea of wonder woman also having different angles to how she was covered when it was a female director versus when it was a male director. And um, uh, secondly, also her suit in terms of the fact that a lot of fan art actually gives her a very comfortable suit to work with that helps her actually carry weapons that she requires or carry essentials that she requires or protect coverage, which uh, a man's suit of armor would effectively do anyway. Okay, so uh, you'd have you know, uh, Iron Man or Batman that wear protective shields and gears. And on the other side, you would have, uh, you know, Wonder Woman who's half nude running through a sort of, you know, a land, land sort of a minefield of sorts. So, yeah. Uh, the corporate hero has been a common trope, but one which is treated lightly in anime culture. Um, I am not an expert in anime culture, but uh, yeah, I will take your word for it. It is indeed representative of a different morality altogether. It comes from anime culture emerges in the East. So it's uh, automatically uh, the directionality of its thoughts and its cultural representations is going to be slightly different. I hope that responds to your questions. Any further questions? Also, hi, Prasita. I just saw you um, over there. Um, Yashwardhan, it's fun. that's a lot to read, Yashwardhan. It's fun that both Marvel superheroes, I love the fact that you took the effort to type that out have managed to create a full on online space that's bringing together people from over yet if you go to the Pottermore website now you have a sense of exclusivity yes and don't I know it from my ethnography classes the fun fact that gold membership is available to a few nations and it's the same with also some videos or for that matter even how OTT platforms tend to gatekeep specific shows uh, so if they can if you have a VPN which is rare uh, in India you can uh, access Shows that are shown in the US or in the UK or in Norway for that matter. But if you don't have a VPN, you don't have access to these shows. Um, if you go into Amazon India or uh, Netflix India, okay. And that IN dot IN gives away a lot, um, and, and your IP address gives away a lot. So you can't 
you're not act, you're always at the receiving end of the dependency that you have on model systems that are being taught to you through media houses so um which dealt with interesting themes including a deep sense of deprivation yes the uh Yes, I, I know the airbender one that you're talking about. Uh, yep. Okay. Very true. Anyone else? Any questions? Nope. Uh, thank you, yeah. Ankita, for that enthusiastic presentation. Um, <laughs> I think there will be questions and comments uh, because uh, clearly uh, superheroes seem to be very, very popular with uh, young people. And of course, yeah. uh, I'm sure everyone. Um, so maybe we could go to the next uh, lecture. Yeah. And uh, all right, so may I invite uh, Ms. Prashita, Dr. Prashita Mukherjee to introduce our uh, resource person, Dr. Surbhi Malik. Thank you, Dr. Rashmi. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Surbhi Malik today for the CIP lecture series. And uh, uh, she is an assistant professor of English at the Creighton University, where uh, she teaches courses in multi-ethnic literature, transnational feminism, and global Bollywood. And uh, she has received her PhD from the University of Illinois at Chicago where she was also the recipient of the American Association of University Women Dissertation Fellowship. Her research examines intersections of race, place, and gender, gender in South Asian diasporic literature and film. She has published uh, in peer-reviewed journals, such as the Journal of Creative Communications, Religion and Society, and uh, Verge Studies in Glo uh, Global Asia's, South Asian popular culture and uh, her article on Hanif Qureshi's The Black Album is forthcoming in the peer-reviewed journal Ariel, which is a review of international English literature. And uh, she has co-authored several uh, articles and uh, books on uh, race, whiteness and intersectionality and uh, it that those are upcoming as well in the handbook for international leadership research with that introduction i would like to invite dr Surbhi malik for the next talk thank you so much dr mukherjee uh, dr mukherjee and dr george and i have been working together so it has been uh, just great and uh, this is uh, i'm so glad to be here i want to begin by thanking dr rashmi george for inviting me to be a part of this intellectual exchange and um, thanks to professor varghese and professor gujar for the gracious partnership and for their really fascinating and insightful talks today uh, i enjoyed them immensely the ideas that I'm presenting today are works in progress. So your any feedback and comments that you might have uh, will be deeply appreciated. Um, St. Xavier's faculty and students, I can see some of our students here. Uh, they have been part of my community of joy for the past three to four weeks as part of the collaborative module that Dr. George was talking about earlier. Uh, so this feels especially wonderful. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint, uh, but I've I do have some clips lined up, so hopefully the technology will cooperate and I'll be able to play them. Uh, but the idea for this talk came about when I was sharing with Dr. George my experience of working as a radio jockey in All India Radio, New Delhi. And, you know, I begin here, I begin with a personal story, so this is going to be a little bit different than the other talks. Um, I have never written about this experience before, uh, about the experience of being a radio jockey. So this was kind of new for me. Um, I have, however, recounted that experience in conversation with friends um, numerous times as I was doing that morning with Dr. George. And every time I share these memories, I experience uh, the same surge of emotions and feelings that washed over me as when I was alone in the studio so many years ago, hosting a Friday night live show on the AM frequency called A Date With You, playing songs for clandestine lovers and close friends. And it was a write-in request show, so people used to write in with their requests, and it was just a thrilling experience. Working with All India Radio was an unlikely job, unexpected. I had grown up in a provincial city in Punjab. Ludhiana was relatively small, its industrial hub 
always pushed outward, but it was small enough that the thought of living in Delhi terrified me. Um, but once, you know, when I was visiting my father uh, in Delhi, who was posted there at the time, I heard an audition special on the FM broadcast. And I still don't know why I felt that as a recent postgraduate in finance who had, you know, spent my entire life in Ludhiana, this was something I could do and enjoy. And, you know, enjoyment was not a word that we associated with anything regarding work in my family. So this was a very unusual choice uh, for me in that regard. At a much later date in my life, I realized that Ludhiana might have been provincial, but it was not parochial. It was a part of the world. The local Kisan Mela at the Punjab Agricultural University. I don't know if you have heard about the history of that place. It is the cradle of the Green Revolution, one of Ludhiana's claim to fame. Um, and that, you know, that farmer's fair sold numerous books by Russian authors with characters named Ivan, Alexander, Misha. That is what we, uh, you know, grew up reading. One of my uncles was taking classes in Russian and our home library was stocked with a series of books in the Cyrillic alphabet. And again, you know, I didn't think much about these things until much, much later. We grew up listening to ABBA, The Beatles and Bonnie M. Um, again, which is very unusual, I realized later. I thought, oh, this is what everyone does, but apparently not. Um, and But the radio audition definitely required going further. Um, so I stocked up on new genres that the audition required me to learn up about, jazz, country, classical. I still remember I went, I went to the Planet M in South X and stocked up on uh, music cassettes. I know it seems like a different world, right? Um, Herbie Hancock, Chick Corea, Miles Davis, Glenn Campbell, John Denver. I was ready for jazz time and country roads. I owned an English pronunciation dictionary that my father had won as an award in a college in what could only be called the provincial backwaters of Punjab. If Ludhiana was small, Fagwara was even smaller and the move from Fagwara to Ludhiana had been a big step up for my father. But still, I thought about what sort of a college my father attended that awarded him, uh, you know, English pronunciation dictionary, the complete works of Shakespeare, a book of English poetry, like all these books he had received as awards uh, from his college in Faguara. What use did we have for all these books and small, forgotten, broken towns? What use was it trying to get a convent education, trying to unlearn all that surrounded us? And then there I was in New Delhi, still connect, disconnected from Bollywood, but connected to jazz, country, and classical music. This was precisely what my life in provincial India had prepared me for, to be ready for the world when I left that place. It had prepared me for the world beyond, beyond it, for the metropolis, for Delhi, for Chicago, uh, where I oddly felt at home because of you know, this particular life story that I had. It had prepared me for when the time came, words like Kushabhav Thakre, Bach, Mozart, Arya, Concerto, Cello rolled off my provincial tongue, making music that perhaps only I could understand. I begin with this personal narrative uh, to make a few points about the provincial. First, the provincial has always been a part of the world. Global knowledges and cultures have always circulated in the provincial in complex and unexpected forms, even though they've not been studied as much. Second, the provincial and the urban are not situated in opposition. But the story, you know, the way we theorize, the way we understand their proximity is important. So it, it really matters, you know, how we understand uh, the proximity between the, between the urban and the provincial. The provincial town is of course different from the village in that its modernities do not offer a stark contrast with the urban. It is an in-between zone between the urban and the rural with a distinct narrative of uneven development and uneven incursions of the urban into the rural where cutting edge technologies and hip hop exist in tension if not in contradiction with unplanned spaces, open drains, unfinished roads and dilapidated homes. So I would say that there are three ways in which scholars have theorized the proximity or dismantled the opposition between the urban and the provincial or rural. 
So the first approach um, can be seen in the works of scholars like Ashish Nandi and Akshay Kumar, who argue that the structure of popular films reflects that the village the urban seeks to leave behind, in fact, haunts the metropolis. So for example, um, Nandi writes that the popular cinema can be seen as, quote, the disowned self of modern India. So, you know, that can be the village in the form of the slum, etc., returning in a fantastic or monstrous form to haunt modern India, unquote. In his article, Provincial Bollywood, Akshay Kumar argues that the provincial is the, quote, residual cultural self trapped in the confident but ill-conceived Indian urbanism, unquote and is manifested as a small town nostalgia in popular cinema, both threatening and entertaining. The second approach to theorizing this proximity establishes provincial's parity with the urban by defining a distinct provincial modernity. So this is, uh, we can see this in the work of scholars like Arunima Paul, um, who says, you know, that the provincial um, might be different from the urban, uh, but it is equal, right? It is, um, uh, there is a parity there, even though provincial modernity is something distinct. And this is how she defines provincial modernity uh, as trajectories, quote, in which are intertwined the obscured history of the developmental state, the post-colonial afterlives of caste and political power, the gradual democratization of caste and emergent neoliberal notions of selfhood and forms of governmentality, unquote. My own theorization of this urban provincial proximity, I would say, aligns more with that of scholars such as Alka Anjaria and Amitav Kumar, whose terms uh, new provincialism and swagger of the vernacular, respectively, are not simply about parity with the urban, but about self-confidence and aspirations to shape the very contours of the nation. And so in a way, uh, you know, it's about upstaging the metropolis at its own game. Uh, the provincial's performative excess seeks to disrupt both the conditions of hierarchy that necessitate a talk of parity in the first place um, and the metropolitan norms of propriety and critique. And um, Bollywood's provincial representation, so I can think of a range of movies here, you know, from Tanu Vets Manu to Tanu Vets Manu Returns, uh, Bareli Ki Barfi, Badrinath Ki Dulhanya, to some extent Hamti Sharma Ki Dulhanya, but Manmarzia, Khandani Shafakana, the two films that I'm going to be talking about today, um, they have focused on what I have called elsewhere, owning with pride what are seen as provincial's unsophisticated attempts to keep pace with the modern. I believe that the circulation of the global form of hip hop in Bollywood's provincial spaces has emerged as an important way to signal provincial hutzpah. And you know, this is the aspect that I'll be focusing on today, hip hop. In general, hip hop's presence in India seems anomalous and unexpected to the extent that it has prompted scholars like Etiraj Dattatrayan to ask regarding his fieldwork in New Delhi, why hip hop? And you know, I think that's an overarching question for us. As Natasha Sharma writes um, in her excellent book, They See Hip Hop, hip hop is an art form that prioritizes the male black and working class body and gives voice to disenfranchised black communities amid urban decay. But globally, hip hop has also been an incredibly syncretic form. And there is a, you know, a significant body of research that talks about the cross pollination and exchange, especially between the Punjabi folk form of Bhangra and hip hop. So outside in the outside the Indian space and the diaspora, there is a long documented history of how hip hop has given voice to South Asian masculinities as they navigate the position in American or British racial spheres in relation to white domination and conflicts and solidarities with black British or African Americans. So, you know, it is, it is an important form with South Asians have engaged in uh, to find their own position in these um, racialized societies. Um, and here I would encourage you to check out the work of prominent scholars like Natasha Sharma, of course, uh, Gayatri Gopinath, Anjali Gera Roy, and there is a fabulous anthology coming out of Britain called Disorienting Rhythms um, that again traces these connections uh, between hip hop and Desi communities living outside of India. Uh, so while South Asian connections and mobilization of hip hop have received a lot of scholarly attention in the diaspora, the role of how the syncretic form circulates in India is less examined. And Dattatrayan's book actually just came out uh, last year, and it is one of the few studies of how hip hop has been used and mobilized in India. 
Even further underexamined is the role that this form plays in Bollywood narratives and visual vocabularies. Uh, so as I mentioned, there are a few anthropological studies on how hip hop offers India's marginalized masculinities in urban areas, um, a site of becoming and spatial transformation to use Dattatrayan's words. I am more interested in the role hip hop plays in our cultural and narrative imaginaries. So, you know, questions like how does hip hop inflect or modulate the stories we tell about gender and class, masculinity and consumption in our current historical moment. That is, in trying to understand how hip hop fits in with Bollywood tropes and its mode, modes of visual storytelling, I am thinking of hip hop as a narrative and cultural force that goes much beyond, you know, its usual iterations of uh, in film songs and dance and music. So it, it is much broader than that. Um, hip hop and songs and dances is important, but somewhat exorbitant of the narrative, right? The songs are both within and outside of the story. But its deep impact is felt in the very ways that Bollywood cinema imagines and constructs gender and its relation to consumption and space. As such, I argue that Bollywood's use of hip hop underscores its capacious form um, that I feel cannot be reduced to music and linguistic performance, but is important for thinking about Bollywood's narrative forms and spaces, its visual practice or vocabulary. And I'm going to quote Data Tray again, uh, again because it's helpful for us to consider how he uh, talks about, you know, that hip hop pushes us to consider the ways um, in which it brings its musical, lyrical, visual, and kinesthetic modalities together into multimodal relations in ways that push against scholarly reductions of hip hop that pose its traveling traditions as solely musical and linguistic, unquote. So you can see here that the point I I'm trying to make is that it is not just dance and music. It is not just song or it's, uh, you know, it's much beyond that. It has an impact on uh, the narratives that we tell. Second, while hip hop is uh, mostly discussed as a global urban form, the language that connects Bombay to the Bronx or that situates Delhi, uh, Delhi's identity as a global city, I'm also interested in what hip hop means for Bollywood's representations of the provincial. So, you know, how does it circulate in smaller towns? What is going on there in our stories and the stories we want to tell of ourselves in this moment? Third, even though I am going to focus on hip hop's imagination of provincial masculinities today, this is not to say that that is hip hop's exclusive focus in any way. Um, and in fact, my article that some of you might have read in preparation for today um, discusses or focuses on why Manmarzia, um, which is Anurag Kashyap's film, uses hip hop to portray Rumi's autonomy, power, and desire. So I would like to pick up from where that article left off in terms of why the film offers different articulations, meanings and possibilities of hip hop for Rumi and her DJ lover Vicky. But before that, I will turn my attention briefly to Bollywood's love song for hip hop uh, that has become inseparable from any discussion of that form. And I'm talking of course of Zoya Akhtar's instant classic Gully Boy. So inspired by the lives of Mumbai's underground rappers, the film's protagonist Murad finds in hip hop a, ling a language in which he can speak to, interpret, and escape from his marginalized existence as a poor Muslim man in Dharavi. The city's glaring inequalities between the wealthy and the poor feed Murad's hip hop rhymes and beats. And you know, I can think of that scene in the car where he's writing this poignant and powerful poetry as he waits for his master's daughter to emerge from uh, this party in a, in a glitzy uh, hotel. He falls in with other rappers and becomes a part of the city's underground rap circuits that hold invitational or impromptu rap battles or go on graffiti runs, defacing the glamour and glitz that keeps his gritty existence invisible. On the surface, the film is an anthem of subversion, right? Of a poor rapper rising through the artistic circuits to achieve fame and recognition as an artist. Hip hop, after all, is an art form that helps him make sense of his life and the forces that keep him down and find a solidarity with other disenfranchised communities across the globe. Uh, Murad shares a special affiliation with the American bard of the disempowered Nas. But I also want to highlight the extent to which hip hop in Gully Boy consolidates a version of normative masculinity in that hip hop offers a path to capitalistic success with the possibility of a reproductive future of family life. 
Gully Boy expands understandings of urban hip hop masculinity by showcasing a critique of capital, both in music and beats, but also through graffiti and defacing sites of composite, uh, consumption. But in this narrative of triumphant masculinity that straddles the contradictions between aspiration and critique, between underground sensibility and capitalist possibility, Murad views that climactic concert, you know, with Nas, uh, complete with corporate sponsors and um, as a life altering experience to be celebrated rather than a dilemma. He has no doubts, right, what he's going to do uh, when he's invited to be a part of the capitalism that has music and language and praxis critique. And for a moment, you know, you're wondering uh, what, you know, um, so um, uh, uh, class conscious hip hop and gully boy is both financially lucrative and competitive. The participants compete for one upmanship and, you know, not only critique and woke anger, but also in financial success. And I think that's a tension uh, that is important for us to chart out in, in gully boy. Gully Boy's narrative of triumphant urban hip hop masculinity also sidelines and marginalizes women. And we've been talking a lot about that in Professor Gujar's talk, uh, you know, how this um, uh, dynamic works. But here we see, you know, in the movie um, that, that the women are sidelined. Uh, the movie reduces them to love interests and seductresses, even if they are doctors or artists in their own own right, right? So they're anthropologists. Um, uh, Safina is a, is a doctor, but they're reduced to sidekicks, you know, whose only purpose in the film seems to be encouraging these hip hop stars in the making to find their voice and subjectivity. So by contrast, uh, Bollywood's representations of the provincial centralize outspoken women to critique hip hop anchored in commercial circuits and performative artifice. For example, the film Manmerzian's Fulcrum is a strong-willed protagonist, Rumi, who is in love with Vicky Sandhu, or his hip-hop persona is DJ Sands. That's the name he goes by. So the film depicts hip-hop as a vehicle of Rumi's self-fashioning and legitimate self-expression. But for Vicky, hip-hop connotes failure rather than a success. And you know, this contrast is really interesting in that regard. Um, for him, hip-hop is a trap of downward mobility or stagnation rather than a stepping stone to something else. And here I want to play that clip um, so that you can see, you know, what how hip hop is perceived in that movie, um, not only by Rumi, but also by uh, Vicky's father. And here I'm going to share my screen and hope that this plays for us. And can someone tell me if this is coming through? You know, whenever I start playing it, just if a if a few people can indicate to me that it is playing and that you can um, hear it. And even if you can't hear it, I feel it should be it should be fine. Okay, here we go. Can you all see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see your screen. Can you hear it? Uh, maybe we have to share. No, ma'am. Yeah, we can't hear you. Okay, let me try that again let me try that again okay let me try that in just one second i might have missed something here so let me okay let me try this again sorry about that okay and if someone can again tell me if you can hear the sound as well this time. Can you all see my screen? Yes. And can you all hear the sound of it right here? Um, and I find the scene particularly interesting because it, it shows a disjunct. We, uh, you know, it's a scene of ventriloquism is how I would put it. We don't hear a uh, wiki story from his own mouth. We hear the visual is on him all the time. And uh, the story is being told by his father, right? Of, of how he arrived at hip hop as particularly after a string of failures of not being an engineer, of not being a business person. Um, but, you know, and he, and he, calls him sans, right, in a very um, kind of derogatory way. Um, and it's interesting, you know, in that particular scene that um, his his hair, which is a mark of his distinction and his hip hop persona, it is dyed blue uh, and you cannot see it in that scene, but that is covered. Um, so, you know, um, uh, that 
that to me makes this um, kind of interesting. So as we see in the scene, uh, Vicky's father views hip hop as neither an art form nor an aspirational career, but as an instrument for him to manipulate and toy with Rumi. And he marks Vicky's pursuit of hip hop as a symptom of his indecisive and immature masculinity, right? That he doesn't understand the value of things and the lie and, um, you know, of a life of giving up in failure. He arrives at this after a string of other, failing in other professions. So in the father's words, hip hop comes across as a, you know, a kind of a newfangled urban import that does not speak to the stories and lives of provincial men like his son. Uh, it can be re read as a facade, a crutch that props up provincial masculinities seen as failures, parochial, devoid of opportunities or ambition. Uh, it's a road that for the father leads nowhere. Um, if hip hop and gully boy is all about imagining a more equitable world and attaining a normative masculinity that involves financial stability, hip hop in Mersian's provincial milieu absolutely resists this futurity. Um, so like just like Vicky's father, actually Rumi too finds uh, Vicky's turntablism, you know, his copy paste remix aesthetic to be insufficient and inadequate for survival and earning enough to support a family. She laments his lack of ambition and talent to produce an original tune and finds his hip hop to be imbricated more with commerce um, than with creativity. So at one point, you know, uh, it's a scene in a Jeep. She says to him, uh, you bloody imposter DJ with your borrowed hairstyle. Have you ever made one original track, always stealing other people's music? And um, the idea that, you know, he's somehow a thief uh, with a borrowed hairstyle and borrowed music occurs multiple points in the in the film. So, and for Vicky, for his part, too, finds uh, that his pursuit of hip hop means that he has the capacity to resist the demands uh, that he, you know, experiences for, from Rumi and his parents alike for responsibility, marriage, and earnings. He feels, you know, he doesn't have to do that because he's a DJ. Um, now I will turn to uh, Shilpi Das Gupta's uh, Khandani Shafakana. And, you know, it's a more aesthetically uneven film. Um, many might find it, you know, uh, yet another Bollywood pop uh, stuff. Uh, you know, it, it's it's more aesthetically uneven than Bodhman Mersey and Gully Boy, which are much better done aesthetically. And we can talk about the politics of that, you know, and what, what would be the value in considering a film like Khandani Shifakana. Uh, but it features a protagonist with echoes of Rumi, but a hip hop star of a very different mold uh, than DJ Sands. So the protagonist of the film is Babita or Baby Bedi. Um, the film repeatedly, in fact, uses these infantilized names, right? These are uh, uh, names that we would use as nicknames or not proper names um, as a mark of provinciality. So provinciality as, um, you know, is indicated through these kind of infantilized names. The working class Bailey family has fallen on hard times and uh, Baby supports her reluctant to work brother Bhushit and their mother by working as a medical representative for a pharmaceutical uh, uh, firm. And then on the side, she has, you know, she is a hustler who tries to sell uh, herbal supplements, etc. So Baby tries to revive the family fortune by taking over the sex clinic that her quote unquote mamaji uh, bequeaths to her in his will. Uh, her mamaji is also mamaji to the entire world, as always happens uh, with these things in India, as a nod to the trust and sensitivity required to treat sexual issues in a provincial space ostensibly closed to conversations about sex. Um, the whole plot of the film is very Foucauldian, you know, it just bears out Foucault's argument that any oppression of sex will incite sexual discourse. And, and, and in that, you know, it's sex is mostly in conversation. There is no, unlike Manmerzia, which has a lot of, you know, references to sex acts, um, this doesn't at all, uh, considering that it's a, it's a film about sex clinics. So it's, it's kind of interesting in that regard. Uh, Baby is a fan of a hip hop star, um, uh, Gabru Katak. Uh, I would translate that as macho fantastic, but if anyone has a better translation, uh, please do share it with me. And it's played uh, by real life hip hop star, Bacha. Uh, and, uh, you know, she's taken aback when she finds out that Gabru is, in fact, a patient of Mamaji receiving treatment for erectile dysfunction. Uh, so I'm going to play that clip in which um, uh, in this clip, you know, uh, Gabru 
is um, kind of uh, almost ambushes baby baby because he wants to keep this a secret that he is under treatment for this. And we'll see how the film visually depicts him and what that says about hip hop. So I'm going to start my share screen again here. Okay, let's stop it right here. Um, so yes, we can talk about, you know, what is going on in that scene visually. Um, Yashwardhan is talking about the change in the music. That's absolutely a part of it. We can think about, you know, what his tears mean at that time. So I'm going to, uh, you know, give you some pointers on how to think about it. And um, I would love that conversation uh, towards the end. So um, Gabru is, of course, meeting baby in secret because he fears that any intimation of his erectile dysfunction will cast doubt on his hypermasculinity and damage his standing as a hip hop star. But instead of consolidating a hypermasculinity, I would argue that hip hop in this case too pushes against a normative masculinity, but in a slightly different way than we saw in Manmerzia. And I would say that it does so by portraying Gabru paradoxically as an androgynous figure. So, you know, he wants to project a hypermasculinity, but I would say that the film is sort of, uh, sort of undermines that. Uh, that is, it shows that the mask masculinity at the very core of hip hop is perhaps a much more complex and unstable than we might acknowledge. In this scene, uh, as you saw, you know, Gabru steps out of his regal SUV, almost in slow motion, which heightens his every move. Um, he stands in front of baby dressed in regalia of fur, glittering golden pants and jacket, grand shoes, big sunglasses, um, depicted visually in a long shot, right? We can see his frame in entirety. Uh, Gabru comes across as an imposing presence and his fur regalia uh, simultaneously denotes luxury, masculine strength and feminized vanity. So, and, and, you know, we can think about how the tears then, you know, when he's crying, um, makes that even more androgynous, right? It adds to that. So this visual operates in various registers, both the hyperbolic persona and sartorial choices that mix the feminine and masculine critique and parody the hypermasculinity that hip hop projects. But they also show the hip hop stars facility with an ease of movement between the different gendered idioms and between the global, urban and the provincial, you know, so he is able to oscillate between these things with sort of relative ease. Um, and he's very comfortable, at least, you know, when we see in that um, uh, long shot, he's very comfortable in his persona. The film's rendering of Gabru's body in the hip hop aesthetic, the bling of consumption as its own authority, is far from Suvadeep Sinha's argument that the non-urban male body is the corporeal signifier of the in-betweenness of the small town. So Sinha is arguing that, you know, uh, the male body is, um, about uh, that, or, or it is the signifier and the symbol of um, the, the in-betweenness of the small town. But here we are seeing something very different. We are seeing a body very mobile between the registers of, um, you know, the urban, provincial, and uh, the rural. So instead, Gabru evokes what Sumita Chakravarti writes as a capacity of the Bollywood film hero to inhabit, quote, various forms of masquerade, including prominently androgyny. So she considers that a hallmark of Hindi film heroes ranging from, uh, you know, Shami Kapoor, Raj Kapoor, Sunil Dutt. Um, she traces a long history of how the hero's body function as functions as, um, you know, this or tries to suture these opposing things. She writes that uh, the quote, body of the hero becomes a map on which nations can appear to coexist in harmonious yet distinctly separate spheres, unquote. So much like the 60s, so much like the 60s hero that Chakravarti writes about, Gabru Gattak is, quote, most comfortable straddling and thereby eliminating the distinctions between different social and national worlds, unquote. He parodies hip hop hypermasculinity even as he seemingly inhabits it. His hip hop persona sutures the global urban and the provincial, but also betrays extreme anxiety about what constitutes either. He commands wealth and power and promotes consumption, even as he's humbled by the need for medicine, which only baby baby as the heir to Mamaji's business and knowledge can provide him. 
So on the one hand, we can see that Gabru's hyperperformativity critiques the construction of hip hop masculinity as powerful, sexualized, and based in consumption. So Gabru kind of you know draws on, repeats, and exaggerates the stereotypes of hip hop masculinity, telling us very overtly that you know this is um, a performance, this is not authentic. So we are automatically led to challenge uh, those kind of narratives about hip hop. But at the same time, by pathologizing provincial masculinity through a narrative of erectile dysfunction, it paradoxically reinstates the sexualized consumptive performative masculinity as the desired state. So again, there's a huge paradox here in terms of that construction. So, you know, by equating uh, Gunubasi as something that needs to be cured and turned into Gabru um, it tells us a different story, right? Uh, the film renders erectile dysfunction as almost a metonym for Gabru's provincial masculinity, something that needs to be cured for Gabru Gatak to emerge as a modern urbane man who can be a hip hop star. So in the film's rendition, it is precisely the treatment of um, ED or erectile dysfunction that transforms Gunnubasi, an ordinary, ordinary man with a provincial, almost infantilized name and a name kind of that is stuck at a nickname, right? Um, into a hip hop icon of masculinity. Instead of hip hop making him a distinguished man or defining his masculine subjectivity in Gabru's telling, a virile potent masculinity precedes and undergirds a strong hip hop voice. So provincial hip hop masculinity straddles the desire to make seamless the chasms between genders and class hierarchies, between provincial, urban, and global to hide the struggle because it is already a precarious gender formation in which the past of Gunnubasi always hangs over Gabru Ghatak's success. Provinciality itself is seen as an obstacle, something that Gabru Ghatak has to undo and overcome to achieve his metamorphosis and transformation into hip hop masculinity. So this anxiety about the provincial compels Gabru to wrap himself up in the urban and the commercial. For example, there is a scene in which he exchanges money for medicine uh, from Baby Baby, and it takes place in the shadow of a billboard that advertises his album called City Girl, you know, which is notable, uh, which showcases the extent to which his objectification of urban women secures his own urban hip hop persona. Similarly, it is telling that when Baby Baby's sex clinic is in financial and political trouble, she reaches out to Gabru Gatak for help, and um, she has to wait as he shoots an advertisement uh, selling My My Shoes, ostensibly targeted toward customers with a shoe fetish. Gabru refuses to be a friend and an advocate for the sex clinic, even though he clearly benefits from it sexually, artistically, and financially uh, because of the anxieties of the provincial that haunt his commercial urban persona and render it precarious and fragile in which one intimation of sexual deviation and pathology can crash his hip hop empire. The final scene both solidifies the critique of hip hop masculinity and I would argue squanders the political potential and possibilities of the performative, especially the androgyny and the push against normative masculinity. Uh, so there is a scene at the very end uh, when Gabru em finally emerges in the courtroom to vouch for baby baby and to advocate for freer conversations about sex. He does so as the provincial ordinary man, Gunubasi, unencumbered by the performative persona of Gabru. Whereas hip hop enables provincial women and urban men to fashion a legitimate self-expression in various ways, provincial men have to give up their hip hop persona to approach something appearing like their authentic selves. As compared to Gully Boy, in which Murad is poised at the cusp of transformation into wholly new being, a commercial success, at the ending of Khandani Shafakhana, Gabru Ghatak is poised at the cusp of a certain unfussy authenticity, a return, if not to Gunubasi, then a deliberate turn away from the glitz and grammar, uh, glamour in favor of a reinvented self more geared towards social issues. Uh, so these are some main points that I wanted to make. I am looking forward to what you all have to say and your questions and comments. I'll begin with Josh Worthen's uh, comment um, was that abrupt unveiling of the hip hop star. First, he appears to be upholding his public persona as a hip hop star. Uh, but once the scene changes, his entire personality and persona takes a 180 degrees. Yes, which does make a very big point, Josh Worthen, absolutely. Uh, there's one question here. Can we say that the Western dance forms are affecting to a large extent the Indian classical dance forms? This is by Rohit. 
was in FY first year. No. You know, it's um, that effect is never linear or straight. So the way I would think about it is that the Western dance forms or Western music, when it circulates in India, it takes on its own form. Uh, the form gets adapted, distorted, changed. Um, you know, it undergoes a lot of um, changes before it circulates. And obviously, you know, there are some contradictions that erupt during this process. Uh, I'm sure, you know, um, again, when we look at the way hip hop circulates in India is very different from the way it circulates in the US, the kind of meanings it subtends, uh, the kind of, you know, gender dynamics it, of course, there is you know, borrowing off that visual vocabulary as we see in, you know, um, the um, the performance of consumption or wearing of bling, it seems borrowed, but it seems to have a very different meaning in the Indian context. And that's why I'm interested more in, you know, uh, what sort of stories does hip hop allow us to tell at this moment? Uh, and these stories are very, very different. Uh, so the one aspect that, you know, I'm going to look at ne next in my research is how has hip hop been used in Hollywood and what does that that tell us about you know um, because hip hop began as a as a dance for dance and music form right um, all it, it is coming in contact with a new form the visual and so it 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 will necessarily go certain changes its story will change and you know uh, we have been talking a lot especially in our coil module about how these cultures are not static they are very dynamic um, you know communities don't this is not to say there is no difference in culture but communities don't own cultures either right in the sense they go out in the world, they take a life of their own. Um, uh, if you look at, you know, the way Bollywood, for instance, circulates in the US, it's utterly fascinating. You'll find these, you know, decontextualized uh, Bollywood moves in some series, a, a popular series on TV. For example, I'm thinking here of a, I think it was a Big Bang Theory episode, which borrowed from Bollywood. And, and so, you know, you can see that it is, it, it is not an authentic representation of Bollywood. And that is not the question. To me, a more interesting question is, okay, what story of Bollywood emerges from that particular, um, you know, rendering it in another medium of the television? To me, that is the question that we should be asking. Okay, um, does hip hop lose its true meaning when it gets trapped in the game of commerce? Uh, that's an excellent question because I would, I would be, I, I would question about what its true meaning is. Even within the US, as I said, there are different um, kind of strata um, um, about, you know, um, uh, hip hop. So there are different, there is an underground version, but there is also the more, uh, you know, the more popular, the more commercial version of hip hop. Uh, so obviously the people who are more, you know, have that underground sensibility and politics uh, do call the people who are more popular uh, sellouts, right? But those people who are anchored in the more commercial circuits have just a different story to tell. They're reaching a different audience. They are reaching, um, you know, uh, a different, um, uh, different forms. So again, it, it, it becomes something else. And I think it's our job as critics to kind of understand, okay, what is this new story that's emerging? Because these are not static forms. Um, I think uh, Rohit is trying to kind of nuance this question further um, by people forgetting the Indian classical dance forms. You know, that's, that's really hard to say, I would think, because I can tell you that even from my time growing up in India, Indian classical dance forms have always felt embattled, right? We have always heard about the crisis in the classical forms, but somehow they keep surviving. So, you know, they are, they do mean things to people. They do have a life of their own. They do speak to certain uh, discourses. Rohit, did you want to add something? Yes, ma'am. Actually, I just wanted to say, ma'am, uh, like uh, I have seen many people who are actually good in classical dance, but then ma'am, they prefer because these classical songs, if you have heard, they don't have a lot of instruments to be used. Mostly it is a sitar or just a, if you see the proper classical songs, which have been played, maybe Bartha Natyam or take any other Natyams or I mean those traditional classical forms. So um, they don't prefer this because they feel that such a slow music, 
in the other hand we have hip hop which is more faster in moving and we have lot of steps and movements lot of drum beats and all so I'm, like this is just a feeling that because of globalization or maybe interaction between cultures or something ma'am somewhere or the other the indian or the i will say the traditional forms are getting affected that's all i want to say yeah no that point is very well taken those points are not at all static those points have those practices those forms have changed and you know we can think of yes they have they are knowledge that have been handed to us over a long long centuries but at the same time if you look at classical today and classical at another time they 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 are different right they're not the same uh similarly for artists right the way artists um for instance now the the whole globe is their market right even for classical dancers and singers right they are able to come and perform in the west bring new audiences uh so you know are uh, those are definitely intention but i also feel that 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 you know their form keeps on changing and they're not static and it's up to us as critics to study how their forms have changed so i hope that you will take on that as as a project in your own research yeah ma'am thank you ma'am so happy to talk to you thank you same here rohit thanks okay um there is an mtv show called mtv hustle among 10 male contestants there were two women rappers how do you think women rappers can gain a footing within the hip hop world is there space for them um yes absolutely in ha- in fact hip hop and feminism have a long standing relation and that is one of the points that i make in the article that i have written that you know um just because hip hop sexualizes and objectifies women does not mean that there is place for uh that you know that there is no place for their sexual self expression as well so you know those two contradictions can coexist in the world of hip hop and in our stories and that is what makes these fascinating um even within the us you know the uh, women are increasingly becoming a part of this um i don't know if you have all heard of dj rekha she was the first big a uh, south asian woman uh, hip hop artist here in the us and so you know there is a, a, a even though the men get a lot of more attention uh this isn't to say that uh women aren't also making a mark in that sphere in fact you know they have fascinating um artistic productions and they're doing really good work uh i hope they get more visibility but to me again the interest is always in you know what sort of stories are we telling about hip hop right now um and and um you know i had mentioned that uh even in these films especially with rumi uh rumi's uh, the film mobilizes hip hop for rumi in a very different way you know she um really c- comes into her persona into her power into her autonomy uh with a soundtrack based on hip hop and so you know i'm i'm i i don't know if i have a definitive answer as to why that happens you know why that contrast is there um that is but that is a question that i'm definitely trying to explore about what is it in the provincial world and again this is not something i would have ever imagined that the women are the ones who are more outspoken and you know um they are cast as the trail blazers even if they are um you know kind of castigated for that but but the men are seem to be having a very different narrative moment there um you know so I think I missed one comment over there. Um I'm trying to scroll here. Um Okay, so uh Yashwarthan is writing um a big part of current hip hop is also that idea of perceived coolness yes about how charismatic or out of the box um uh they are which also determines how trendy or popular they are as well yes absolutely you know the cool factor and and wiki school factor is definitely plays a part in uh you know the way he's able to not fall into that trap of normative masculinity uh you know he doesn't feel the pressure to earn or uh, you know he feels very content in certain ways um which is which is again interesting but rumi's critique is that he is a commercial artist and not creative enough again you know which adds a new dimension uh to our understanding of these characters and of hip hop in india so uh you know and that is what i was trying to point out i think with gully boy being very class conscious very politically uh you know progressive but at the end moment where where the co- game of commerce shows up as abhinav abhinav is saying you know when the game of commerce shows up he's there 
he wants to do it. It's not a question for him, uh, which I just found utterly fascinating. And and so, you know, uh, Gully Boy, for instance, really kind of pinpoints to a point, a place where we uh, where this might not be a binary as we are thinking it to be um, that, you know, the artistic um, and the commercial or the underground sensibility and capitalist possibility are not binary opposites. Um, in fact, fi uh, you know, this uh, woke hip hop is very much crucial to a financial success in Gully Boy. Um, yes, I mean, I'm absolutely hardcore too. There, there are a lot of uh, women uh, hip hop artists. Um, I, I would encourage you to check out Natasha Sharma's book, They See Hip Hop. She does trace out a lot of South Asian uh, D women DJs in, in the US. And that's, an, uh, that's a book that comes out of anthropology. So many of you will find it interesting. All right, any other questions or comments? Uh, or any questions to any of the speakers? If there are any questions. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Malik and uh, uh, Professor Nitin Bartis and also uh, Professor Ankita Gujar, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for bringing it to Bollywood. We started with science fiction, went to the world of heroes, and we are back to uh, uh, to Bollywood. Uh, it's quite a journey that we have made. And uh, I think, uh, I don't know if you want to ask each other any questions, uh, <laughs> the resource persons. I think I had a chance to ask Professor Varghese, but if uh, Professor Gujar has any comments because I know that her and my conversation were definitely, you know, about capitalism, about um, some of these uh, issues of politics. So I, I would be curious to hear if she has any input or insights. Um, yes, in, in fact, when you were talking about, I'll just put my video on, uh, you were speaking about um, the, this, this particular scene from um, uh, Gully Boy. And um, she kind of sprays. Uh, he kind of sprays on this bridge, okay. And it's interesting that she's the one who incites that idea in him. So uh, with my students, when we'd gone to watch Gully Boy together for the pop culture class, it was a matter of do we look at this as a white person's discourse or do we look at it as women's empowerment? And I found that to be a fascinating question that they raised because I didn't have an answer to that. I went like it could be both. It could be the fact that you know, oftentimes. You need external um, interference, if not interference, but external information to be able to uh, manipulate your own empowerment through somebody else's narrative. And uh, it's, uh, say, something similar to how uh, Kashmiris would use a version of Bella Chow uh, when, you know, article, uh, uh, the, the whole uh, presidential rule was put in place and all of that. So um, that was just like this interesting point that I had in mind. So, yeah. That is that is so important because really, you know, these films and even, you know, in Datta Trayan's book about hip hop, the Western anthropologist coming to these communities and trying to, you know, change up their things and influence is definitely, and, and it's a power dynamic, you know, as um, Professor Gujar so aptly puts it. And uh, and so two things, you know, one that. The second one, uh, I would I would turn to Uma Narayan, uh, uh, and, and she writes in her book, Dislocating Cultures, feminism is not a Western construct. If we look around us, our feminism comes to us from our mothers and grandmothers as much as it does from anywhere else. So, you know, um, I, and I wonder if you see that, Professor Gujar, in the superhero work. Are there any superheroes from India, for example, that you examine? So there's, there's one, Shaktiman, of course. And but also, I think just, just to add on to this idea of feminism does not need to be in the in the image of what Occidental feminism stands for. Uh, there was, uh, uh, I think, uh, Meghna Gulzar, who created Razi. And one of the things she said about Razi was that I wanted to portray a spy, not as like a Lara Croft kind of, you know, wearing shorts and having guns and uh, going in like that with muscles and all of that, but somebody who could wear a Punjabi suit, uh, be a married woman, uh, be able to make breakfast, integrate herself with the in-laws family, 
quickly and still um, could stab somebody with an umbrella and and be introduced like that. And um, I found that fascinating to be a sort of you know in a sense that you don't need to be occidentalized and muscular to be a spy. And that's the Indian version of, in a sense, feminist empowerment in that in that space. Of, of course, I mean, you have the dramatic narrative of patriotism, the anti-Pakistan sentiment, of course, that comes up. But uh, that's another sort of complex layer to it altogether. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm sure we could have continued the conversations. <laughs> and I'm sure if we were in the same time zone we could have started much earlier and we could have continued the conversation but thank you i'm sure uh, it's great to also have an unfinished conversation because there's so much to look forward to then uh, on that note i'd like to invite our student uh, one of our uh, first year uh, ba students tarini to propose the vote of thanks thank you ma'am uh, hello everyone and a very good evening it's my pleasure to propose the vote of thanks as we come to an end to our online lecture series on pop culture organized by the Council of International Programs, St. Xavier's College. So on behalf of our organizing committee, I wish to express my sincere gratitude to the management of our college, our rector, Father Keith D'Souza, as well as our principal, Dr. Rajinder Shinde, for their unstinting support. And I'd also like to thank our vice principals, that is uh, vice principal academics, arts, as well as the sciences. Uh, I must also take this opportunity to thank the three of our speakers today, uh, Mr. Nitin Varghiz, Dr. Surbi Malik, and Ms. Ankita Gujar for their thought provoking and immersive lectures, as well as their comments. Um, truly an incredible learning experience for everyone in attendance, I'm sure. Uh, thank you as well to our faculty in charge, Dr. Rashmini George. Thank you, ma'am. And our student volunteers who uh, made sure that today's event ran smoothly and was an immense success. And lastly, thank you to all of the audience uh, and the participants on Zoom as well as YouTube for your overwhelming response to the event. And uh, please do fill the feedback form. Uh, we've put the link in the chat box. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Over to you, Rashmi, ma'am. Yeah, thank you very much for this treat that you gave all of us. Um, and I would also like to um, acknowledge my colleague over here, Dr. Prashita Mukherjee, and also Ms. Lydia Fernandez, who was with, here, with us in the beginning of the talk. And I can see lots of friends, uh, colleagues uh, in the list, um, in the participants. Uh, list and of course our students who are here. Uh, so thank you very much once again. And we should uh, continue. Maybe we should think of other topics to discuss uh, in the future because pop culture is so vast. There's so much to discuss. <laughs>